Uh, I understand Celeste is on the way. She should be joining us shortly. Um, first item. Okay, we'll move that off to the next time, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark to give us an update on this perspective. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you didn't say what's going down on Capitol. So uh, <laughs> that would be a, perhaps a longer and, and not, I'm not the best person to get that uh, update on that. Um, uh, suffice to say that this session has been an interesting one for, for many people, um, very different than, than the ones in the past. We're still in uh, certainly budgetary um, discussions um, with the Ways and Means and other committees of the bills um, that are uh, that have been moving through in regard to measure the gate in regard to um, shifts in the, uh, the the workforce board and and other things are still passing through the uh, and have been approved but then it lands then very competition we're still awaiting those the final uh, those final conversations there. Um, a quick update, um, there's been a lot of activity over the last month around uh, career-connected learning, um, pathways making stronger connectivity between uh, education, workforce, economic um, prosperity, not only here in Oregon, but across the country. A team um, uh, from Oregon went recently to Denver uh, for a Western Pathways Conference to learn from uh, Colorado, from Nebraska, from other states who have been doing this work and had apprenticeship models looking at um, industry-led uh, initiatives to try to do exactly what we've been trying to do, and that make, is make stronger connectivity between um, our talent needs uh, for our industries, our talent needs for economic development, um, and uh, shifts in our education system to try to be more responsive to preparing individuals for uh, a, a different world. I'll say that. It's not just uh, employment, but for a different world entirely. So um, those have been really good conversations to have. Um, Il Ilana Pertolgini, the governor's uh, policy advisor for Force of Labor, led that team um, along with the employment department and add a representative Reardon and Salman also. So that was good and there'll be some follow-up um, conversations uh, across agency and across industry and, and others. Um, and then most recently, as of Wednesday, uh, Washington State had a uh, governor's summit on career connected learning um, that was hosted and sponsored by Washington STEM that brought a lot of people in from world from the industry from uh, civic uh, organizations and elected officials to participate in this competition uh, interesting to, to look out some that future and then uh, of course conversations with uh, OCF have been also focused on um, how do we uh, incentivize and, and leverage funds to support uh, that group well so those conversations are ongoing. Appreciate support uh, at OCF and that work. So today we've got um, actually a very very full day, and I want to first of all thank um, the agencies, the Department of Education, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, for really working um, very very hard to try to put in front of you today um, qualitative and quantitative data around. Uh, these, this current uh, investment portfolio um, at a time when those grants have not completed and there's not eva full evaluations of that work. And so it's trying to sort of measure temperature midstream and we've, this council has recognized in the past um, the challenges with uh, budgetary cycles um, and investment strategies trying to get those to line up that ongoing struggle for agencies. Um, to report on that progress to date while we're also looking at making recommendations for the future. So our purpose today is to engage in those conversations um, to uh, uh, with the agency leads regarding the impacts of those current investment portfolios and, and to look at recommendations for the future. Right. That. One other question. 
question. I understand it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was a while ago. <laughs> I have a lot of your guesses then. Any uh, thoughts on how that went? I yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. Everything that we hoped for when we created the STEM Investment Council and, and tried to uh, create a focal point for all the groups to get together. It was, it was a great meeting. A lot of the two days of uh, wind-blown Newport. We got to land there during a of a storm. Great though. I, I thought it was again exactly what we want. Have a central place for everybody to have a good dialogue, uh, share best practices. Uh, build on that. I think that you know everybody recognizes that a lot more of those conversations yes. could and should um, take place around specific problems and practice that arise from the work that learn from each other and think differently. Yeah, my one comment would be as we move forward and have more of these, they need to be stopped about just everybody getting together and talking about the big issue. It needs to get down to some specific issues, uh, focus a little bit deeper, specific uh, all of them. This one in particular uh, did a, a lot of focus around equity issues, around how do we improve access and opportunity for um, uh, communities of color, uh, traditionally underrepresented population, rural. Um, each uh, Did that final evaluation get um, Chris, you will give a little bit more about where we are in that process. Um, there's uh, EPIC, the Education Policy Improvement Center, as you know, has been working with us to, uh, and working with us to really have uh, sort of a growth-based assessment, uh, quality improvement cycle. It, uh, issued surveys to a lot of the partners in each region and are currently having conversations with each of the partners about the specific um, outcome of those, uh, of those surveys. Today you will see some of the summary data um, related to that uh, process uh, as well as some internal comments from the council. Okay, we've got uh, some updates on these various investments. Just to remind the council, we allocated about $4.75 million to STEM innovation grants. Those are the first four items that we're going to talk about. And then the last item, we allocated $2 million in post-secondary. And that was spread across a number of uh, post-secondary institutions. So we're talking today about $6.75 million of investment that we made, more or less. Plus the hubs. Plus the hubs. Another five. five. Yeah, yeah, the hubs are on this list. But yeah, so that's... They're number four. It should be in your. We have two oh, on the back side. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Sorry, right they're yep. on the back side. Back yep. side. So, so uh, we'll get a chance to review our investments as we think about uh, the next cycle coming up. We want to see how we've done, how those investments are paying off. And kind of what so, one question of clarification in regards to that cycle you mentioned that we're at a little bit out of sync, obviously, with the end of the fiscal year for the biennium, yes, and then when we start back up. So, my understanding is the biennium ends oh. at June 30th. June 30th, right? And so, uh, but the funding for this particular set of grants runs through the end of the summer. But what has happened is that the Department of Education has worked very, very hard to move heaven and earth to try to, from an administrative perspective, it's it's been a it's been an enormous undertaking to try to get continuity for these grants over the summer. Uh, for the Department of Education grant. I, I don't believe that's true for the, for the post-secondary STEM towards grant. Okay, so um, the, yes. the money turns off, so to speak, or they're out of money on this set of grants it's, in general by the end of the summer. It's a no-cost extension, right. essential. But it's for, for the and use funds that they have not used. And we're talking right now about putting um, processes in place to try to ensure continuity for the STEM hubs in particular uh, with some of the new budget. I'll try to get some emergency bridge funding while we're finishing up assessment processes. Budget. Yeah, and, and that's just not normal 
you know, uh, from an agency budget perspective to try to do that work. And so really um, kudos to particularly Donna Brandt uh, at the Department of Education working very hard with her administrative work going all the way up to the Department of Education to get this kind of uh, exception approved. So the continuation, just for timing's sake, then that gives us through the summer to make decisions associated with evaluation of previous work and extension of grant. Yes. Extension. So by or new grant. So we have to have that done by July. Yeah, we'll have to await really the budgetary decisions right. of the legislature before we can. But no matter what the decision is on their part, we still are going to have decisions to make by July, August. We'll, we'll want to do some July and August conversation. Okay, so uh, we'll get into these first innovation grants, really talk about the progress they're making, kind of where they're going, and we'll get a sense of some of the questions here and ask, ask some questions through that as we think about the next cycle. So, uh, Don, you're... Uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, the time here today and for our staff to be able to share with you. I just want to kind of set the stage real quickly. Um, Mark talked about some of the how we're looking at best is is obviously to support STEM, but also about how is it aligned with our Every Student Act plan and do we into the opportunity there that about a well-rounded instruction the well-rounded education that and really is a nice complement to as well as other students at our um, we're looking at this as is the best And across the area, we have work, work on, um, elsewhere. The other thing that um, you're going to hear and be well aware of is how do these investments also our educators and our youth do absolute learning does it just occur in um, brick and mortar. So these investments are also <coughs> very critical to this well roundedness outside. And really seeing that learning at first so everywhere. And so um, very, very grateful people for for this investment. And lastly, I'm gonna be really I'll have uh, plenty of time, but you know, our team has um so please be sure to ask the question. Um, they are the content expert on these grants so what it look like around. So with that, I can ask you one question. As you think about what we've done to date, are you thinking at all about how to scale broader closure state? We've had some conversations and you'll hear a little bit of that in this research. Um, yes, definitely there are some that are, are more scalable than others. And what we have so okay. they're gonna share with the rest of the Great, thank you. Yes. Forward to that. All right. Oh, okay, so at this point, Sue Wilson is on the line, and she's going to get something to the power. All right, we're going to hope my connection is good enough. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. And, all right, I see a PowerPoint up there, so we should be good to go. All right, so... Uh, STEM, our STEM innovation grants expand the implementation of effective STEM learning and propose innovative approaches, strategies, and programs that build professional capacity for transformation of education systems, specifically in STEM fields. In order to prepare students for 21st century education and careers, new and different ways of teaching, learning, and connecting are required. In, in allowing the risk required for innovative projects, it is imperative that the entire STEM ecosystem is able to learn from both the successes and not successes of project programs and strategies and to identify system components that drive or restrict this change. In this session, oh, and for advancing slides, I'll just kind of say advance right there. So next slide. Uh, in this session, we will address the following for each of the innovation grants from ODE. Uh, each will include uh, approximately eight 
minute presentation followed by opportunity for some Q&A. All four of these programs are still in progress with three of the four extending uh, funding through September 30th. We have attempted to capture impacts and key learnings. However, we hope you understand that all data is preliminary as they're still uh, in progress and with final reports uh, to come in the fall. Following the discussion of the four investments, we do have a, uh, two more slides um, that address some connections and insights of the overall investment strategy and connections between the four. And so I'll hand off to uh, Tom Thompson to start with uh, the Math in Real Life grant. Good morning. Um, so let me share a little bit about uh, the Math in Real Life on to the first slide. The, um, the grant had several purposes behind it. One is to uh, create an environment for innovation, uh, build student interest, grow a network for teachers. So we're trying to put together a group of teachers that are actually working together on the same problems. And then also building a repository for lessons that these teachers are developing. The slide shows uh, kind of green and yellow. Green is we're, we're reasonably certain that we're, we've made significant progress there. It's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> yellow is not bad. It's just that we, we have we have evidence that we're making student, we're making progress on student achievement and, and interest in mathematics, but if that's a longer term process. There's a lot of evidence out there uh, nationally that this works. So it's not a bad thing. It's just that um, we can't say that definitively that we have moved the di dial on that particular piece. So next slide, please. Um, the project involves six regions, six regional uh, parts, they, and all of them are based in STEM hubs. You can see a map there with a the little red um, your drops or whatever they are, showing where these projects are spread around the state. So that's and and each of these projects then um, connected schools in that region, to teachers, math teachers in those regions, um, to work on this common problem of developing math in real life lessons, understanding what that looks like in the classroom. Okay. Um, so the impacts, additional data, as Sue mentioned, will be in in September. We'll have some uh, things that they've been collecting all along. But what we can tell you right now is that we've had, uh, we estimate over 12,000 students experiencing new lessons based on the number of teachers we have in there. We also have evidence that students are really um, uh, making interesting progress in terms of understanding mathematics. Um, one example that, um, that comes up in my mind is um, some of the work that's been happening in Lane County and specifically where students have actually been doing some fairly sophisticated work, middle school students in um, in uh, statistics and actually looking at boundaries, uh, school boundaries and impact on the demographics. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And presented to a group of equity. people on and, and equity and equity issues, which is really pretty amazing. Um, teachers, we have uh, 121 teachers who have been part of the project. They were developing over 100, 100 lessons, roughly, mm -hmm. it could be over that. And, um, and we also hear some incredible stories about how this transformed teaching. One middle school teacher in particular, um, has a goal next year of completely revamping her math curriculum for middle school based on what she's learned and experienced here. Um, there are more stories like that than too many to tell, and people can gather more of those. Next slide. Then um, also important are system impacts. Um, the fact that all of these are connected to STEM hubs, I think is an important point, uh, that, that STEM hubs are integral in the development of this work and will continue to be able to be part of that work. Um, we have been using common measures of success developed through the Portland Metro STEM Hub. Um, not all grants have used 100% for various reasons, but we've been actually had an opportunity to use those and kind of compare projects, six projects across, using, across one another using those measures. Um, the equity conversations have really grown, and two projects do stand out. I mentioned Lane, but also um, at Eastern Oregon in the STEM Hub. They've invited um, Running Horse Livingston in to actually work with them on how to use, how to um, uh, how to design lessons that uh, that, that uh, tie into Native American um, culture their cultural um, context. Um, there's also we have a repository that we've been putting that we're starting to put together now um, using some uh, probably using a, a, a tool that is actually being developed by uh, Amazon. It's actually, kind of like an Amazon shopping for lessons kind of thing, and then. Um, uh, we have the uh, network of practitioners. We actually pull together the leaders in the project in the network, and then they work with the, the individual teachers. That. And finally, this summer, at the end of the, the, uh, the month, the end of this month, there's a statewide summer institute at OSU 
and a number of the projects will highlight some of their work, and there will be a lot of work, a lot of uh, guest speakers that are coming in and sharing that with you, even more broadly than just the product teaching project. So some of our insights that we've gathered from that, um, and I think the number one is the really most important one to understand, is the product process are inseparable. So we have we're a collection of lessons. Simply having a collection of lessons is not going to solve uh, the, the, the issues that we're trying to deal with, we're trying to make that more relevant for students, get them engaged in that. Um, that's, those will be nice tools that teachers can use, but they also need to have the time to be able to understand how to use those effectively. Um, whether the model that we're using right now is the right model, or there are models that are better models that are more efficient models, still we need to have teachers coming in and be able to somehow working with those with each students and understanding what that is. Um, they, an important point is that also the teachers um, had to break from tradition that math teaching around the state, around the nation, is uh, almost predictable. Uh, I used to supervise some teachers in mathematics, and um, it was almost predictable by the minute what was going to happen class without even looking at the lesson plans. Um, so there's a there's a major break from tradition here that needs to happen and that's a that that is that's hard work for, for any teacher. Um, there's a, we have a number of very rural teams so there's been very very creative rural team models that we've seen um, in terms of uh, bringing together teachers that are spread out by huge distance and also teachers in schools where they are the them. and and on top of that maybe teaching beyond other things other than that, or they're the middle school and high school. Uh, they don't have a team in school. Um, and then this part where math curriculum needs more space for innovation, one of the things we hear back, not only from this group, but a lot of people, is um, this concern that, how am I going to do this when I have to do all this other stuff? So some of the projects, other projects that we're working on is trying to work on ways to increase depth in math teaching and decrease the breadth. Try not to cover everything, but cover what we need to. And, and, and it, much ways and the work coming out here really provides that depth um, and so and I pointed out that there is other work going on with ODE with tech and trying to develop some of the uh, and deal with some of the issues that are broader than just that um, and then this uh, this um, having coaches uh, innovative coaching uh, going out and working trying to work with teachers and be innovative is really a powerful tool and that without the coaches in each project that would be I don't think it would be as successful. Each project did hire somebody that is would right, not have a teaching ability. So um, that comes to what um, our recommendations might be for this project in the future. And I put some dates on here. 2020 um, is kind of a magic date. And I kind of worked with uh, Mark <laughs> Reed on this. 2020 is when we start looking at the new math stand. And so the intent is that when we start looking at the new math standards, this is not a new conversation, that it blends right into what are the new math And then that blends into the issues of breadth, depth, and those kinds. So by, by that point, we, we want to be able to reach a tipping point of 300 to 500 math teachers around the state. We feel like that's the, that once we've done that, then you're not going to have to be, it, it's going to sell itself. Um, that's, I think we, that's a hard question. So I think we, <laughs> that, sure was this is based on like three to 5,000 in middle yeah, school there's, high school. there's, I believe like 36,000 high school teachers in our state total. And some yes. Okay, that's right. Yeah. So this is a, a 10, 10%, 10%, 10, 15%, you know, somewhere in that range. Um, the, uh, we need to, um, Refine, part of that is we need to refine the networking practices um, and from what we've learned this year, so building and strengthening the work we're doing, um, and develop additional supports for changing practice um, that, uh, that that are things that we've learned about in terms of the work that we continue. Um, that probably can, be, can happen with, it, with existing funding. So keeping projects like this going, bringing in new teachers in that project, that doesn't change a lot in terms of funding. That's, Another piece of this is um, what we call leadership for innovation. So simply working with individual teachers um, is an important piece, but we also need to develop leadership in the region. And that leadership needs to be teachers who are at the point where they're innovating in their classrooms, they're bringing back that stuff. They're, they're the peers, they're the people that are the most influential. And so um, what we would like to be able to see is this moving into uh, a, a different kind of professional development for some of the leaders out of this project, 
um, that are uh, for those MAP innovators. 2018 is roughly having those MAP innovators identified and moving through, so that would be in this next, next cycle. Um, and then each STEM hub region would have a team of MAP innovators. That may take a little bit longer um, for, for, because we only have six STEM hubs involved, so it's going to have to spread out a little bit more, but making sure those innovators are available within the STEM hubs. Um, most of that work it could happen at the existing funding levels by shifting some things and emphasis around. And then finally, um, I think one thing we're seeing is that we need to really build a post-secondary research practice component for a variety of reasons. Um, there, the, there's a lot of research out there that there are people that are really good at identifying what are those good practices and being able to look at that, dig into that. We need to be able to tap into it. Partly we've begun that process by meeting with OSU and working with them and also having some preliminary with UVO. That's not the whole uh, landscape of available out there. Um, we definitely are going to need to connect to teacher preparation as we get new teachers in. I would start off on the same uh, boat there. And um, then actually getting some research-based feedback. How do we know that it's working? How do we know what's working? And right now, um, people that are really well-versed in how to do that. Um, and then uh, the next thing is that somewhere along the line, it needs to be moved to an elementary level. Um, right now, we're working in high school. What does that look like? And we have people in the state that have a really good grasp of what that might look like, and that might that partnership can help us develop that. Um, and so we'd like to be able to say, bringing that into play in this next biennium, we'll kind of build those partnerships. Um, that because of that, would probably require some increased funding on the current investment to, to access that. Um, not, I, I don't know what the dollar amount is there, but but that's something. That and I'm going to turn it over unless there's some questions. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Anyone have any questions? Can you refresh our memory. What's, what was the uh, grant size? We used, uh, it was, um, I have the, the numbers per grant. It's about, well, it actually we changed, it was really about 1.4. We kind of balanced some things out. So we put about, oh, you moved some money around. <laughs> yeah, we moved some around. And, and that was, and it was, uh, we kind of looked at that to figure out oh, where wow. could we use it. So uh, when we got okay. the investments in, when we got the, the RFPs in, um, this allowed us to move to six uh, rather than five and have some money left, you know, kind of thing. So it was about 1.4. Each each project ranged anywhere from 200 to $250,000. Um, How many FTEs are tied to that? Um, the, the teachers are 121 teachers. So they're, the and they're getting they're getting a variety of compensation. Um, as it, as it, yeah, so in, in case most schools, in case um, if they're coming out during school day, they pay, they pay for substitutes. They're working in the summer. They'll be usually are compensated for that work in the summer. So that's the that's how that blended. There's also money that goes to the um, coaching staff that are working directly with those teachers to develop their professional development. So there's time out there, um, materials, meeting spaces, all of that. All there. The teacher actually coming up with concept, what they want to do, like Bob County, the county uh, teacher out there measuring volume of these aisles that we call it. Yes, and what's interesting is that for the most part, it's not necessarily an individual teacher up with an idea of the team, but a, a true professional. And our leaders have, that come in and talk to us about these things that this is the, they, they said that this is the first time they really felt that they had a, a true professional where teachers are interacting around a particular problem or practice, going back to their classroom, trying it out, coming back, talking about refining. In some cases, I was talking to a teacher at Grants Pass that we've run this lesson, developed one lesson, run it, fired, and modified it five or six times to get to the point where we felt like it was So it's a lot of work, a lot of time to do. The last question, for me at least. Um, you kind of look down below in terms of what the supporting infrastructure is to make it sustainable. Have you looked above? Are the superintendents and principals bought into this? Are they a, a practicing community that we have to address trying to expand this beyond just one or two schools? Yeah, in the end, yes, it's going to have to be that work. What's interesting is that we're getting um, principals, not wide, but principals are coming to us asking, saying, we need to do something different in math, and this is mostly at the high school level. Um, we need to do something different, and um, what what can we do? So, so yes, but there's also 
there's there's that question from from a we're not we're not we're not doing what we do. we're not reaching all kids. Um, so so yeah, so that work needs to happen in some way. It also the fact that you've got teachers now doing things kids engaged that helps elevate those. Any other questions? Anyone who are on the phone on the council have questions? Fabulous progress. I, I see your passion oh, in this. I think exciting. it's exciting to see what we're doing here. This is really, uh, this is really amazing stuff. And it's sad that we're only at ten percent. You know, not even ten, probably at, what three percent? Maybe. Yeah. Well, we're getting, we're yeah. making there. That's yeah. time. That's a progress. That's a good part. I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Free. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Green, I'm a math education specialist at Oregon Department of Education. Um, I help manage the uh, adaptive math pilots as well as math and real life grants. Um, so the math and real life pilots, I, I wanted to frame but the kind of what the issue we, when we had looking at this uh, funding is. Um, one thing we know is like uh, we have students who need where behind, not grade level. Data from last year was 42% statewide is the average of on grade level students. That's half of our students are needing some kind of help to get caught up. So that, we know that's an issue. Um, however, we'll also see like we have uh, personal technology in our office. We use laptops and day to day life, but it's not in, in the classroom instruction. Lots of that. Um, but devices weren't designed for education, but business. So we're still learning education how to if students personal devices of that function. Um, I would emphasize that this is not the intent to replace teachers. We know teaching social activity, um, but how can we supplement instruction? There are parts of teaching such as uh, <coughs> gathering data, uh, you know, monitor student progress, or um, individualized instruction. So again, one homework assignment to everybody, how that helps them their, their needs. So we talk about adaptive math. Um, we're, we're talking about computer-based instruction programs to provide instruction to students that are adapting to the individual needs of students. So you could potentially have 30 students on a platform. And they're getting 30 different experiences. They're tailored to what they are needing at that time. So that's the platform they're out. Um, so kind of the purpose of this, I, I like to emphasize this is a pilot. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know <laughs> about this because it is kind of we're venturing into new new territory. Um, uh, what what's out there? That was one of our objectives. Like how many programs? What, what programs are options out there? We just, things like coffee shops, you know, like at the water cooler. But how many things are? Uh, that was one of the goals to discover. Uh, we actually got 17 different platforms and our process. And then also begin the process of what's what platforms are effective. What platforms are excited about? Um, opportunity to integrate technology, so part of the grant funds could be used to purchase hardware. Our goal was two to one, so two students to one device, um, allowed for district purchase this, so allowed districts who did not have technology to the grant. Yeah, some grant some schools are already one to one or two to one, so they didn't use that much technology from that people to be their their attendance by paper. <laughs> so, but all of a sudden they have a full change environment. <laughs> so we were definitely I think uh, learning a lot. The measurements we're looking at, the student achievement and classroom practice or keeping track of. Also the attitudes and beliefs of students and teachers about their ability. I, think I put those as yellow because uh, in data in the summer. <laughs> And midterm data is kind of December, but else All right. So the impacts we had 17 school districts. That was about half of the 34 applicants that applied. So it had a lot of interest. In this grant. We prioritized districts who who had um, by math achievements, by need, by and, uh, demonstrated that they were below state average on state assessments and also high diversity. So and if you look at the map, we have actually quite a few uh, rural and small districts that were funded, and the Portland Public was funded, but outside of that, 
they were interested in. So, 17 districts. Next slide. Sure. Are those districts. Could you assess bandwidth? Internet bandwidth? Be able to access system? One of the criteria when we when went through the application process was readiness. So, readiness being you have, you have technology, you have that professional development, you have bandwidth. Um, so, that was something that we looked at, but there was one like, in Oregon, I believe, some districts that have that. So, they that's 4G. So definitely would like that. Anyway. Uh, the investment was $1.15 million. Um, piloted 15 of the platforms, let the districts choose. They had to choose two or three platforms to pilot. One. If it's not platform piloted. And 17 school districts, 33 schools, about 100 years. Thousand. One of the questions we had is like, how, much, how far will one million dollars go? <laughs> it's like I didn't, I couldn't answer that question. Now I can have a sense. How much it cost to do? It was KH. So we could like, let districts choose what classroom they want. Some just did A five, or some did. A3. And most of the most of these computer based platforms out there are public. So I can so some preliminary findings. One is there I think we definitely hit a nerve. <laughs> this is a lot of interest in, in school districts. They're making investments in technology. They want to they have like this intuitive sense like Dave's advisor, how can I change instruction, make it personalized. Um, there does seem to be programs that are promising. Um, and good things about so in the scrim and filter those programs by how how they also have some data from the beginning of the year quantity growth. Um, there is no I think one point is like there's no silver silver bullet. <laughs> um, not something you can just buy and put front kit bubble um really a dance between teachers, administrators, students, parents, and all the information is So with one platform um, for well, one setting, but might not work better setting. Students, the district, different platform, different age groups, different platforms, better well. Um say platform mean content of content. The platform would be a, a specific vendor that has a computer program. So we bought licenses for the year for, for the number of students. So we, uh, most of the grants were about 95 by 7, 50,000. So we had licenses. They had a, a platform, so they make their vendor. But they had to do two or three. But in, as part of the pilot, but it's one. <laughs> so how they pick those plans? I we started the process with an RFI, so we called vendors, so discovery. So we found seventy vendors and had them respond to um, have the criteria for adaptive platform, provide instruction, reports, plus instruction. So the vendors had to respond to that and show how their platforms met those criteria, and then we shared those responses. The districts were able to see the R by response, evaluate which one seemed like students. So we provided the, 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 an RFP app. So they chose two or three. Already, I've, I know some of the stories districts, they, they were really excited about one platform, had to do a second one. And at the end of the year, they realized that second one was actually better <laughs> for their students. So having that. I think they're ready to do one platform. The technology I They were a lot of them were tablets, um, uh, but a lot of them, there were also Chromebooks. I think it was kind of split as a Chromebook. Some some tools were Chromebook patches. So that probably split. Uh, my 
the lessons learned is there's a lot of front loading that we need to do. <laughs> there's professional development helping platform, how to use it, technology. So there's still a lot of lessons how best to do technology, math instruction, and also we discovered IT. Um, I'm not a I'm not a computer person. <laughs> a lot of people working on this are teachers, and they realized that there was a lot of IT issues. Um, bandwidth, getting some login, things like that, that kept um, schools from. Here's a login for a five-year-old. <laughs> yeah, so that's a challenge. Uh, um, so there's a lot of IT support that, that about that is not education, but important. And also, I think that in letter finding, uh, how much it costs. One million dollars, and we infected four or five thousand students. Uh, half a million students. So either we're doing, at the, if we really wanted to replicate this statewide, a million dollars, um, or we could do over a hundred biennium, I guess, two hundred years. So it's a, uh, it's significant finance. But I guess that leads into my recommendation. Next one. Um, it's a lot of money. <laughs> I think that what the role of the state is in this uh, hardware and licensing um, is it's hard to see as being scalable. Right, that, that has to be investment locally. Um, structure, school, textbook. Districts are interested in buying. They're interested in buying. So I think that's how we invest a fund. That, that's the part to scale up. But at the same time, it's, there's there's a lot to learn. This is new territory for our teachers, new territory for our administrators. And so, Really important issue as as that's more in technology to pair that with best practices um, to use this effectively. So it seemed like the idea of a network practice coming alongside districts who are investing in this technology, learning with them, and sharing information. So there's that one to one investment for our grantees that we have. Investment. How can we learn from them? Uh, connected to like I think our math and life has a network regionally. How can we uh, think about network practice around this issue of integrated technology construction? So also I discovered a lot of connections to improvement. Yes, school improvement grants. So schools are wanting to help the help students and then also personalized learning, uh response intervention, uh, uh, multi tier system. Federal law that provide tiered support for students. Also, once we have pictures of possible coding, um, other So, I think there's has a lot of connections. Important question. Certainly, there's interest in districts. I guess I'm just curious on the ongoing sustainability of this, obviously, between the state's responsibilities, ESDs, and or districts. They're making curriculum decisions at all times at those levels, correct? Level and at the ESD level. Um, they have the funds, boards, for all the field. So, I, I mean, are we at the point where we need to make a recommendation that? The time has come, these things are available, ESDs are to look at this, but not be in a position at the state to try to fund and or implement this across the state. Because the scale has to be down at the, I, mean, I guess that's, so I'm asking about, are, is this something that's ongoing? Is this something that we need to be looking at and continue to fund at any level forward? Or is it something that instead we publish our recommendations to the districts and Maybe have an advocate inside the uh, OED to continue to continue to push this and recommend it, but not necessarily continue to investigate or try to scale it at any level from the state down. I just don't understand how we're going to push this down. Got to, other than be able to make a recommendation, 
because the decisions aren't made in the state of Illinois. And although we can, like you said, throw a little bit of money at it to get people to maybe be interested in it, try it, you're talking, like you said, 50 by any. Yes, that's like hot. Well, I think the districts are, are purchasing hardware. I mean, so that, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to be buying hardware. Well, I assume that's many districts have done this independently of us. I assume there's those four districts that have gone forward. I mean, it's, what is our role here? Is it just to make a good, solid recommendation? These are the pros and cons of 17 available solutions. Please try to stay away from this third. <laughs> this third's in the middle, and this third is best case. Or what are we? What's the final outcome of this, of this grant? Yeah, I mean, I, I was welcoming uh, other agency thoughts on on or comment. I, I think that uh, that's the essential question. Is, have we learned enough to make a solid recommendation? Would, would be one of those things, or will we, from the data, be able to make that kind of a strong recommendation to uh, to districts who are looking to purchase? That? Well, they're going to be purchasing all of it. Wanting to support mathematics instruction, in that regard. Um, I certainly think that uh, we have learned something. Is it enough to make that solid recommendation? I would add, at the people who have a very profile, we may need few other profiles of the streets that when we have to do the platform is going to work for this as a rule also, or it's a cross of the other things our process of standard of looking at and as we are forward um, this process may be somewhat you have a list of those buttons? Yes. I understand what we're talking about. I mean, everything from Math Blaster at the bottom all the way up to Khan Academy for online access for I'm curious on what what's being evaluated. Yeah, we can sort of to that. And, and I think one of the things that, that could as we go forward, I mean making some initial recommendations to districts, but there's also an opportunity to crowdsource reviews, right? So as districts implement beyond this grant, you know, there there's others out there who are implementing that platform and inviting them to make comments to help um, steer their peers across the state would be another role that play. I'm just trying to figure out because yeah. it's worth another $1.1 million. Oh. Yeah, I think that's, this that's would be one question. of those areas that we, we, we don't have the funds to scale in a big way. We've learned some good things from it. It certainly shows a lot of promise. Um, but this may be a, a place where we can read funds or if, you know, if overall budgets last to, to be allocated in fashion. I think there's another question here, and maybe it's down the road, but why does the school district need to own the technology? No kids ultimately like like a notebook, like anything else, it's part of the requirements, and then you have a scholarship program from an equity perspective to deal with those kids who can't afford it. But given this is going to be a continuum and that you want the kids to have total access to it, not just at school, what why isn't it something you say, here's your school requirement, it's not a notebook, it's a, it's a Chromebook or an iPad, and, and for those kids who can't, or have a resource have a program or something. The state doesn't feel like they have to fund everyone. Just think, that's, that's, think about this. Yeah. Care and of and that's students. certainly a central tension within the education system as a whole, right? Uh, bring your own device, what it's provided, what's our IT support look like, what's our refresh rate. So we would need to bring in, you know, have that conversation. It's fairly large, actually, and bringing in other experts like Carla Wade, um, from the Department of Education who have been looking at working in education technology for years about what that looks like. Yeah. 
you can create standards. You need this kind of tech. Right. This is our school. We require Chrome or these kinds of things. Now you have to worry about aging out, but the school's going to have that same problem with aging out of technology. So, you know, you give kids iPads, three or four years are gone, you know, maybe out of date. Right. It's pretty expensive for the school district to have to replace that. If you to do that. Absolutely. Isn't that just part of the student's requirement, just like you used to have a cat bring a calculator to school? Yeah, but so, so, Jim, as to put on that path, there's another dimension that is also considers it's the map. It's controlling, because one of the problems is that when you have devices, the are a little bit different. And we have this within our corporate environment, but it's even more dramatic to be able to manage the actual device itself. We have to put on it, we have to set up. And it's very, and so, that's, so one of the key aspects yeah. is being able to manage that experience in, in positive ways. So I think that it, it's a good it's a good idea, but it, you have to also recognize that it is a complex issue. you want the kid to take his device home, to be able oh, yeah. to do things at home, to be able to access it. You make it cloud-based. Everything internet-based. <laughs> you don't have to worry about if it's an Apple Chromebook. Or like like that's basic standards. And where if you're at home or if you're at school, all you need. And then we get into major equity issues around and yeah, um, then the last mile access to particular rural communities, which the Department of Education is working on and, and leading um, those conversations really. The yeah. opportunity to talk to at and and that's what they're thinking about is how do they provide that then to the school part of their value to the community. Something to think about. This is really expensive. You talk about 500,000 kids and you know, books and then classrooms. Well, I, th I think that there is going to be investments in locally in technology in the next decade. I think I would rec like to recognize why why can we practice one of the tensions, pedagogical tensions happening in mathematics is to talk about we want a rigorous math to talk about procedural fluency, conceptual understanding. Technology is really good at procedures and, and kind of good on concepts and very Hard to do Apple. So just thinking about the presentation we just had, that, uh, that's application. So there's a tension of, you now some districts can see this as an easy to pull it, here's technology, and we're all doing the application. So how does that balance work? How do we get, how do we keep those applications in there for the aid? Still use technology. So I think. Need to better understand how together. That's what. Helps. Yeah, I think that's where the research can help think through this. And what is the strategy issue? Practice where you get all the components. Learning. Other questions? Anyone else have questions on this one? Well, good learning. I think uh, this is one of those bigger challenging ones, but. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You just leave it on this slide for a second. I want to give a little bit of background context to the grant. I am Dick Brock, and for for here today. And first, I just want to uh, really say thank you for investing in digital literacy and computer science. Um, the focus on historically underserved students and network community teachers because we at ODE can definitely not do this but um, a little bit of background on this is the knowledge and skill that teachers bring to instructional practice and student engagement needs to increase in uh, the state's second fastest growing sector in technology, the first being healthcare and software. And we know there is more demand than local supply while so too often though students are self selecting out computers because it has not been introduced to them in a way that So the first step in ensuring that students have access to the data economy is well-trained teachers with resources. This will increase the number of fully prepared, um, supported teachers, and then they in turn can create the and that's the first. So the next slide, please. The purpose of the grant, um, is first to increase student access to high quality computer science CS coursework. Um, it's aligned to technical standards and it means that it's work in the industry. 
Secondly, it's to create a statewide collaboration of computer science educators to professional learning skills. Um, and then these teachers can, through ongoing support, leverage effective teaching resources and share with each other. And then it's also to reach out to educators with statewide access to professional development. And then this will increase teacher preparedness to successfully implement instruction. So this also includes which is the yellow area because it won't be until the end of June, but it includes a statewide framework um, that will decrease achievement gaps among computer science and digital literacy, especially among underserved and rural students. But, okay, so the measurable impacts on this grant, um, this table is showing progress toward the goal in this grant. The columns reflect the results of PE, which is really where the process starts with um, having access to So some, some data here, 70% of teachers in this professional development uh, were first-time attendees, 81% were 6th through 12th grade teachers, and 98% surveyed after they took the PD and went to the ALC so that they strongly agreed that if the workshop shop met, met their needs and that if offered, they would definitely um, attend again. For example, in Lane County, due to collaborative efforts that are going on, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the further slide, there are 18 computer science teachers on the board. Um, most teachers that I spoke with, I spoke with some rural teachers who attend this professional development as well as metro type teachers. But most of them said that they started um, as a math teacher and then started incorporating computer science that they learned into their math course to teach. And then during that time as they were incorporating, teachers noted that being in the PLC was invaluable in providing them the resources and support they needed. That they probably wouldn't have been able to roll out the course just on their own without that. One said she finally felt computer science was valuable <laughs> and that she wouldn't have been able to run it. So again, we, we talk about teachers, you know, doing it kind of on their own, their own little silo, but valued, uh, seen as valued. So as a result of this investment, 81 new teachers are involved currently in the field. And it's forecasted for 200 after the summer. 30 new programs or courses are in development for the next year, 10 of which are programs of study, ET programs of study which is not only a deliverable of this grant, but it's really good news because the program of study they have uh, involved in that, the business the director of appraisal community, the business community post-secondary alignment and that partnership. There are a defined number of classes that Not a defined number of classes, but credit. So if they're, they're a completer, um, they complete uh, at least one required course and two credits. So usually it's going to be about two or three credits classes. Um, but you can be in a startup phase, start a business three years, <clears throat> and, you know, have a three-year rollout. So, you know, start with one class. And okay. So the next slide is the measurable impact. So providing um, system impact. Providing PD for teachers has a systemic impact, obviously, throughout the state. So creating these networks and PD opportunities is built around key partnerships. And you'll talk about the partnerships in the next slide. But it's um, kind of interesting where the PD sites were and then where the educators came from to actually was a community it's college, PDs, college. The PD sites, yeah. um, some, they, sometimes they were held at colleges, sometimes they were held at some of the partners would offer their space. Yeah. Okay, so the next slide talks about the partners, and this is um, one of the key elements of this 
deliverable here, they include ESDs, colleges, nonprofits, STEM hubs, businesses, um, and they're sharing the vision of increased skill sets in STEM. Partners have opened doors for opportunities also to extend the scale of this grant. So, for example, um, there's been a collaboration between PSU, the grant recipients, and the University of Oregon to um, apply for the National Science Foundation. But they're working on that together. There's also been internal collaboration at ODE, in myself and uh, the person working on the digital literacy state plan. Um, and this will be presented to the state board in the fall, where we are with this, and um, framework deliver deliverable from this grant that was mentioned earlier, blue and yellow, is informing this process. And um, also, part of that framework will include the ASOT degree, and that's going to be included to pull that in. So there's a partnership with Lane County ESD, as I was mentioning, for 18 computer science teachers and training for next year. And I found, I think that this is a model that can be replicated in the state um, because it's building capacity by, by bringing teacher leaders together to a systemic practice. Um, there's an organization or there's a hub connected Lane County that's beginning to work to be connectors um, for work toward this. Goals. They're articulating between secondary, post-secondary, um, and providing internships for students, working in business, and also externships for teachers. So the partners, and then the um, professional learning slide. There you can see these are the ones that are that are currently going on because of the PDs that happened most recently. So you can see the types of PLCs performed from the professional development participants how often. So the next slide on inside. <clears throat> Speaking with teachers and computer science coordinators, the common themes started arising for uh, about these PDs. The most common was that computer science teachers had to network and share with other computer science teachers because oftentimes if they taught it, they were the only one in the school. Um, so within that network, they felt valued, they had the resources they need. And then access to resources that, that, that uh, it was common to hear that they wouldn't have been able to survive, as I mentioned earlier, that first year um, without the support of the network. 87% reported they were able to successfully implement what they learned in the um, through sharing with colleagues, creating lesson plans, implementing activities, and auto or program study. So I found that, that a couple areas had good a good start on scaling collaborative models. For example, because teachers are so busy, communication ELC can easily fall off after the professional help. So these teachers really needed a connector, uh, someone who's in charge of organ. With that next step. Um, and as I said, there's a model in Lane County that's an example of where it's just beginning to happen. So it's not just anymore you know, through the PLC teacher to teacher, it's becoming increasingly teacher to industry, teacher to post secondary, M hub, to the business So I think this is the type of model we want to. Use if we wanted to scale up your science across the state. Um, sorry, not quite yet. Um, also, finding new teachers, I found uh, to teach computer science. I thought, oh, that's going to be really tough. You're going to you know, roll out this professional development to everyone and then you know, it. But that was actually easier than anticipated. Quite a few math teachers incorporating it. And of course, funding for PD is definitely an issue. Teachers not have ended up being paid for, um, so they could do that. And then also business and industry support, the engagement, each building really, really necessary. And where that's happening, um, 
teachers feel valued, the network is growing from, you know, for instance, one teacher I spoke with said, yeah, before I even took this PD, I went out into the business and said, what are the local jobs and what, what are the courses I should be teaching? How should I align it? If she was already developing that connection. But not very many teachers do that. She's definitely a high flyer. Um, and then also more trained teachers is to see that it's creating an incentive for districts to offer more courses. So I think administrators are saying, oh, look at the teachers that took PDs. You know, I want to offer, you know, be able to open them. Classes, courses being offered. Yes. It's mostly teacher development. That's the transit. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think on that previous slide that was blue, it talked about 30 new programs created, and 10 of those are programs of study, but um, you know, that those programs could be anything from, you know, starting one new class or starting it within a math. Class. That happened this year is in like the next, next school. Right. So 30 already have happened. And then, you know, I was counting before I came in, but I already have 10 programs of study that aren't even included in that graph for yes. this next year. Yeah. Is hardware been an issue? Talk about that relative to that. Right, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have not heard that it has been. I think that's a question, but that's been a problem. Um, for at least for the teachers that are taking I ask that. I think as we try to scale this up, that's always the impediments. Yeah, that, that you may know what to do, but if you don't have the technology in the classroom or you don't have the right technology or whatever it is, you're not going to take scale. Yeah. That's that's a lower barrier. Than small, you could just find that one in the classroom. Compilers. It's about the teacher. Right. Yeah. So, what I'm hearing here, it's easier to create a CS teacher, STEAM faculty, than it is to go find a CS teacher and bring them in to the situation. As opposed to, I mean, so I, I understand that math, math once upon a time, math and computer science were in the same department at all universities. They're not anymore. And uh, you're telling me that you're hearing about math teachers wanting to learn CS to incorporate that into their their math classes as opposed to CS class. Well, I think that's the first step. Okay. You know, take a PD, you know, oftentimes you don't come back and have, you know, all these students that want to start this class or have an administration that can actually open up an exception. So what I'm hearing is these teachers that are taking the PD tend to be math teachers that want to start important issue. And then as it grows, you know, you start having so many students in your math class and say, yeah, take that next level, then that's that conversation with you. Your science classes are fully uh, allowed to use CT revitalization grants, I assume. And I would assume CT. CT dollars that will be available whatever they were whatever they're gonna mount to from uh, measure 98 available to spin up dedicated CT class programs you mean study. programs of study programs of study and then there is no CS endorsement for school teachers there's an endorsement there is an endorsement yeah. so are, are the professional development working towards that endorsement is that endorsement still going to require that teacher to go back to the university Grade. Well, there's a CTE endorsement, so you can be a math teacher, and then you say, okay, well, I'm going to be a course as a CTE teacher, then that's where that director appraisal committee comes in, and they say, okay, we can get much industry experience, and then that's a, a process. So there is an endorsement. But if I'm a recent grad at Oregon State University with a CS degree, and I want to teach, right, and I go get my teaching Certificate, certainly, yeah, 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 obviously, but there's no. What am I getting endorsed in? There's no seat. Uh, just yes, yes, endorsed. Teaching license. There's no, there's no endorsement. Mm -hmm. okay, right. So what CS is in schools is going to vary dramatically across the state. <laughs> no, I just, from my own experience, I've been 
I got credit for taking Excel and Word as a CS it's a bunch of crap, right? Um, and versus taking true language programming that teaches you know, the thought process, the organization process of, of what we're looking for, getting these kids engaged at the earliest level. Thompson, I mean, once you, I know you got tons of experience getting this going within school, right? What what is the magic formula launch? Seems like I, I understand that professional development is one thing and building up a, a grassroots, but there seems like there needs to be some support from the districts, the state, and everything else to be able to make this actually go. And it seems like if we don't have an endorsement in science, we don't call it out, then how in the world? I don't think it's motivated. I think it's motivated by the real desire. And I think the mind is more willing to. And that's the real power. It's to move from a model of instructional model. So you are able to find younger themselves want to be able to learn with their students and to coach them in that process. Really, when you take some of the most effective CS teachers we've had in the state, we've had some very effective ones. That's been their model, is co-learning, and that they don't pretend to be the expert. The premise was always that you had to come in with a knowledge set that gave you the authority to teach. What we're finding, and I've been has seen amongst multiple schools, that if you find a young teacher excited to learn, along with their students um, and provide a, there's so many platforms to learn, uh, starting from very simple um, understanding of digital block-based program, onto then when kids want to learn Python, just say, solve a problem, this is where you learn. So many resources for that learning process that it allows to really move to that learning model very, very easily. And I think that that's really why you can see accelerated learning happen very fast because both the students want they want to solve problems with them. That's a real distinction. Do you see this fitting into that? Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely, because the whole the whole role of professional learning, the whole sense of creating a community, is absolutely for your point that uh, teachers have always had the sense of being. You know, in in that building, but when all of a sudden they get connected with the sources of their peers, it's really the peer-to-peer -peer learning, the co-learning that happens among the teachers, and the co-learning that happens amongst the teachers, the kids, that accelerates this process. So when we first did our analysis about five years ago, we saw that um, the Sierra uh, Foundation did it. We saw we had only 40 CS teachers in the state being able to one to at that point, we as an industry said, holy cow, we have a problem. But to your point, that it's not a going in. Now, if you have a developer and they can make $100,000, why should they want to go and teach for $50,000 or $40,000? It's not going to happen. But it will happen where you find these teachers become excited to be full learners. They want to begin solving problems. And they allow the students to I mean, the, the, the rate in which these students are able to learn is astonishing and can outlearn the teachers very, very well. And but, but so it takes a different style of teaching. This allows that, that coaching facilitator model. But these younger teachers are very comfortable with walking and know that they don't need the source of knowledge, that they can be the guide to help in the learning process of focus, challenge. So I think that this is where CS has a real opportunity to actually help model a teaching style that can have more deeper cultural impact in school. Do they still need like a guru or something that they can go to? Because if they're all at this lower level, they don't maybe see the higher level. Do they have to have some person or some access to a resource that really can help elevate their thinking in terms of learning faster or something? Absolutely. That's where you have the role of DLC. That's where you have, I mean, when we spun up a program at Newburgh, and Colin said, if we want to spin it up, I said, go talk to Terrell. 
they got a conversation going because Terrell has been, been really at, you know, he's been at this so long. And there are people within the community really been doing this, but how do you accept that? Basically amplify the knowledge set and the modeling of that learning style and the and the being able to identify the assets. Then these teachers start learning. <laughs> And they have a, a um, internet space through a Google Doc where those questions say, yeah, oh, I'm looking for a lesson on this. That's what's great about these. You know, and then that huge network of partners can say, you know, I'll connect you with this person. You create a Right, right. And then another, um, we we're mentioning about teachers, another great pipeline is retiring. This is for the business help out is people who are retiring from these that want to go into teaching. They don't want to full on retire yet, but they can also get a seat. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's great, and there's there's going to be a handful. Right. Um, but that's not how you build a state. Better, the better yeah. application for retirees is that kind of guru yeah, consulting. Yeah, yeah. That resource. That they exactly. resource that people can access, yeah, yeah. to help solve problems and think future about them. And to be realistic with, with some of this as well is that for principal, they need to know that, that there is a demand and an interest. And oftentimes, that question hasn't been asked in a way that they're getting that response from, from the students and from a rental community nationally. We know, as Denise said, 93% of, of parents you know, support increasing computer science in the schools. That's not a well-known <laughs> fact when you talk to a principal necessarily. So understanding student demand, support from the principal to take this approach finding uh, a, a teacher, young or old, who has uh, interest uh, as a co-learner, and then having that catalyst and that external support, whether it's from peers or from an industry volunteer. Those are the things that kind of need to be in place where it's a kind of takeoff, right? A, a cultural shift, breaking down that isolation. So I would encourage at some, some level a dialogue with the university system, producing this this. My own example, I, I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't care what I was going to teach. I wanted to be a teacher. I chose social science because it was the thing that interested me most, but it wasn't my passion. It was just I thought it was the thing I was going to be able to do the best. If, I, if there was a computer science path or a CTE path that involved computer science and computer design and all these things, I would have chosen that way over computers or social science. Way more interesting, way more. So, to think that we're taking, why would I become a, a school teacher because I can go make $150,000 as a computer scientist, you're going after the wrong people. You need to find people who have teaching in the core that then be exposed to, hey, why don't you, why don't you focus on this? And so I would, I would encourage us to look at the, the university level, make sure there's a pathway there that they can take four or five classes and, and uh, get their license. Okay, okay. Wrap, yeah. up. wrap up recommendations. Um, four quickies. So I would say funding at the current level would continue to support professional development, PLCs, and then computer science coordinator, who is that connector between teachers and the field. That connection we talked about. Um, this will ensure sustainability and it will also build a systemic leadership cadre teacher in. What's this one you put Sorry? The commitment of administrators also, so stronger connection with those that we already mentioned that earlier, prioritizing digital literacy and I think across all subjects. Um, bringing in new teachers also would be just having them be at the meetings, talking to them about the importance. And then um, Similar to what Mark was saying, I have this, this recent study that 90% of parents want computer science education, but only 8% believe it, know about it, or, you know, it's, so there's a disconnect there, and I think connecting help that. And invest in scaling the current models, successful models of collaboration that already are showing some success, so they can be replicated around the state, possibly. And then lastly, supporting efficient by the districts, how they can leverage the current K-12 funding um, to provide more percent courses. This is one with measure 98 and T 
CTE revitalization of range of size and bridge that we feel up. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, Denise. Okay. That last bullet really around communicating, I think, you know, is, is a critical thing. You know, communicating those data and communicating uh, from the department and leadership in general and business industry too to advocate locally um, for more focus and, and part of that support beyond the transactional support at a local level. And this is where we see Lane County really taking off because of industry engagement and leadership around this to help districts really see how to do this way. So. And I think that we're going to see that happening. There's a huge, huge interest in that. Yeah. So I think that in the next few years we're going to see a real strong commitment to their work. Sue, Are you guys ready? Yeah, we're ready, Sue. All right. Um, so, hello, I'm Sue Wilson, an Applied Math and STEM specialist, and I'd like to first thank you for investing in informal education uh, and recognizing that many of our out-of-school providers uh, have long been um, the experts in well-rounded and applied learning. Um, I, I'm lucky to support the out-of-school STEM, uh, out STEM innovation grantee, STEM Beyond School, uh, which is a partnership between Oregon State University Extension 4-H and the Portland Metro STEM Partnership. Uh, this is 1.5 million was allocated for this particular project. I'll go ahead and advance. Thank you. The STEM Beyond School project is designed as a leadership development opportunity for out-of-school community-based programs. In addition to supporting NGSS professional development, this project works to intentionally build the capacity of programs to design, resource, implement, and evaluate high-quality programming for our youth. Uh, most SBS sites are housed within community uh, organizations, including six that are led by culturally focused organizations. This network is the first of its kind in the, in the country. Uh, go ahead and advance. Four key innovations guide this grant. Uh, first, rather than scaling a given curriculum, uh, participating sites are empowered to implement the programming that is most relevant and of interest to uh, youth in their area. Second, rather than uh, a workshop-based workshop models of support, the grant pays for high dose of professional development and ongoing support for program providers. Uh, STEM Beyond School provides 80 hours of professional development per site within an ongoing uh, community of practice structure. The project takes the requirement of serving at least 70% underserved youth very seriously. And, and instead of focusing on recruitment, they've um, partnered with community and youth development organizations who already have strong relationships with those populations and are already serving uh, underserved youth and families uh, to bring uh, STEM programming into the already existing programs. Uh, lastly, the, the project takes um, both are, or go ahead and stay on that slide there for the map. Um, the project takes a, a regional and statewide approach to supporting out-of-school learning programs. Uh, four regional coordinators build strong relationships with site educators and host regional gatherings and professional development opportunities. Uh, this is strategic alignment to all 11 STEM hubs and other state initiative programs allows for crowdsourcing of additional professional development needs, as well as resource sharing and regular social opportunities um, to connect and learn together. Go ahead and um, advance. To date, network um, impact of uh, 47 sites is spread throughout the state, providing 1,092 students, a total of 46,993 hours of STEM programming. Um, additionally, the, the network's approach um, overhead and uh, $738,000 of grants and leveraged monies 
have impacted local communities in the form directly um, of st uh, staff salaries, transportation, admissions fees to local um, sites, and uh, supplies purchased. And go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, the following example illustrates um, the interconnection of culturally and linguistically responsive community-based education and engaging high-quality STEM experiences, as well as strengths-based community of practice leadership. Uh, in Malala, a group of um, tw 24 uh, Latino-Latina youth in grades 4th uh, through 8th grade regularly attend 4-H uh, SBS programming in the community room of Plaza Los Robles apartments, where most of them reside with their families. They meet weekly with 4-H community coordinator Rodrigo Corona, who also established a parent advisory committee to ensure effective communication and a volunteer core. Their field experiences include all family members whenever feasible to strengthen family bonds, increase trust between the program and the community, and provide new opportunities to explore STEM for both the students and adults. For example, seven siblings and eight parent chaperones, together with two staff members, uh, attended an estuary tour with Marine Discoveries in Newport. For the vast majority of the youth, this was their first trip to the ocean, and none of them had ever been on a boat. The group was lucky to spot a California whale. Afterwards, youth expressed interest in marine science and watershed and aquatic ecology when identifying subjects they wanted to study during their programming hours. Uh, since then, students have engaged in fish stewardship, hatching, raising, and releasing salmon fry, and conducting um, investigations in water chemistry, salmon life cycle, ocean acidification, and site-based stream ecology. Uh, other units of study, sorry, it's loud. Um, other uh, units of study have included robotics with drones and renewable energy. The SBS program here has many heavily engaged parent volunteers. There's been no STEM programming in this community, so families are excited about the um, new opportunities of this program, with youth and parents making a firm commitment to participation uh, in program delivery, including uh, all 70 hours of the program delivery. Lessons are delivered in Spanish to include family and because research shows advantages to brain development from bilingual education. Um, and the program is committed to focusing on building self-esteem encourage, and encouraging youth to take pride in their own culture. Um, educators working in this site actively participate in STEM Beyond School professional development opportunities including sessions on youth voice, partnerships in STEM, off-site field programs, equitable teamwork, and trauma-sensitive practice. And they have shared their expertise in family engagement, off-site field programming, and building community relationships. With the high level of family engagement, the student STEM learning is supported uh, well beyond programming hours. Uh, go, go ahead and advance the slide there. Uh, so that was kind of a a, a narrow look into one, one program, but a, a systems view and, and learning uh, from, the, from the network point um, include first um, the, the uh, Symbion School Project uh, is working to develop and implement a pro program assessment tools and provide network supported implementation um, to build uh, a shared definition of high quality programming across the network. Um, and build capacity uh, for data-informed continuous improvement at, the, at each local site. Um, second, a, a lack of data systems um, is an equity issue. Uh, currently, there, there's no existing system for out-of-school providers to access demo, demographic data about their, their youth. Um, and especially at this age group, you don't want to just say, like, what, what demographics do you fall within? Um, so t traditionally, projects are... Um, allocated to um, locations with um, high percentages of youth that, that you know, diverse or un underrepresented um, in the hopes that students are served. In this case, um, uh, Symbium School wants to know that each site is supporting 70% um, attendance, and we've developed a, a kind of uh, 
through ODE, through a number of, of ways to access some demographic data and report out aggregated, um, but it hasn't been an easy task um, and may not be scalable as, as the um, project grows. Uh, related to that, the third um, recruitment, the, their, their identification that re recruitment um, does not be, need to be the key strategy for closing opportunity gaps, but instead networking STEM specialists with community providers, ensures target populations are served, and builds the capacity of both groups, um, of STEM specialists and community providers, uh, to, to serve youth um, and positions both as leaders in education change. Um, lastly, one of the biggest impacts of this grant is the flexibility of regions and sites to determine their need. Um, and in many cases, especially rural, Access to transportation has increased opportunity for site-based uh, STEM learning. Go ahead and advance. As, um, as for recommendations, uh, evidence and information show that program um, that STEM Beyond Schools program uh, plans, processes, and productivity have potential for long-term benefit to organs, learners, and communities and continued levels of state funding uh, in order to promote capacity building, scaling, and sustainability. Uh, opportunities uh, to do this include prioritizing relationship building uh, with, with our um, state's tribes in order to learn what current STEM and CTE programs exist and ways that their expertise may help STEM Beyond School support uh, Oregon's American Indian Alaska Native Plan um, and to engage more youth who are already attending those programs um, to have access to uh, STEM programming. Uh, also, a number of um, formal educator networks um, focused on shifting science and math teaching practices exist across the state. Um, and I think identifying opportunities to connect um, innovative formal educators with uh, the, the networked informal educators could increase the impact of, of the parallel efforts. And finally, as the first network of its, of its kind, there's a uh, huge potential to research this approach to systems change. Uh, seeking research opportunities uh, not only would increase funding and um, sustainability of this network, um, but also clearly com um, communicating the evidence of impact uh, will, will build sustainability moving forward. Uh, and I. Thank you for listening. Uh, any questions related to STEM Beyond Schools grant? I have one question. Just related to the program in Malala, it seems like it's pretty grassroots. So the, uh, whether it was Rodrigo or Janet, they, I guess Janet developed all the program content on her own. Did she have support for that? Or is it just her own initiative to put these programs together? No, I, I, I think um, the, the partnership between 4-H and the, and the goals of the STEM Beyond School, uh, you know, focuses, provide the supports for people to, to kind of dream big and, and look at how do we take what we're currently offering and create access to STEM learning uh, for, for our site. And so they, they've done that. And, and granted, uh, they've done an amazing job identifying those opportunities and and designing uh, that programming, but I think connect, if that's if that's on the ground, when they're attached to a network, those ideas spread, and other groups um, there's there's that potential for other groups to go, oh, we haven't thought about it in that way, and do their own uh, program development, and then uh, for Malala to learn from other people's uh, kind of approach to STEM learning, also. Have you or are you going to bring all these community partners together, the sites that have got funding, to sit down and do a lessons learned, what worked, what didn't work, as part of your evaluation? Yeah, so uh, so far there's been two all sites gatherings uh, supported by Symbion School, and and a huge part of that is is bringing, allowing, you know, providing the opportunity for sites to share around. Uh, different topics uh, that, of interest and that their communities of practice have identified and to share across. Um, I, I was able to attend the second one in Redmond and engage in those conversations to learn uh, 
you know, what's working for them and, and, um, and to, to witness how they're sharing across and building that community. And I, I hope that, so the uh, funding was extended through summer um, and, and I believe the, the goal is uh, one more all sites gathering, though I don't know that that's been fully secured yet. Any other questions, uh, council members on the phone, any questions? No, all good. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do have a question. Um, Sue, uh, in one of your recommendations, you uh, focus on soliciting private funding dollars. Can you speak a little bit more about that, about the blend between you know, what state dollars uh, have been used in terms of building that, those support structures, those community-based uh, connections, <laughs> and that culturally responsive approaches? Um, how do, you, do you have some thoughts on, on how to uh, encourage alignment of, of private funding with these efforts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, long-term a, a network development, um, I think the state wants to support, but maybe not fund forever. So one, one level is just uh, moving towards uh, other forms of funding. But in terms of alignment, um, well, and I would say in terms of scalability, so there, there are limits on on administrative uses of state dollars, and so um, the it's a five percent indirect cost, and so the the flexibility of funding if you want to scale uh, local sites, and and it's a huge ask of of sites to provide the direct programming to students and do curricular design and professional development and sharing in a network, um, and and. I, th I think every site would benefit from more FTE. That's that's kind of the state of nonprofit and community-based life. Um, and so, uh, as as other forms of funding are identified, whether research or or more foundational dollars, um, I think it provides an opportunity to scale uh, the the number of sites that can engage and therefore the number of students served, but also at, at particular sites that are are uh, doing high-level work, how how can they scale their own capacity? And so I think there's opportunity to to use um, this network and the the program evaluations and that type of thing to to look and say, hey, um, this this is a less risky um, uh, investment because of the amount of supports that are provided by being networked. Thank you. Okay. And just another question. I, mean, I assume that this program, these programs will continue through this summer. This is one of these programs that has a continuation to it that we're going to continue this summer for learning. I believe so, yes. Okay. All right, Sue, thank you very much. Look forward to further reports on your progress. This is one that I think um, private funding is going to have to be a critical, critical part. Yeah, there's several things that were raised in this uh, that around you know the program quality, um, communication, understanding of structures and intermediaries, and the flow of of uh, you know supports for um, these providers from professional development to staff turnover. Uh, you know, organizations like Organ Ask have also been doing some of this work, and um, the folks at uh, some of our our foundations as well. And I think that. Here's um, bring greater alignment across those multiple efforts um, that that needs to happen over the next uh, year or two uh, as well, so that we can really truly think about the kind of system that we're creating and how do we get the diversity of program opportunity available to those students in, in a, a wide range of, uh, of situations from our rural communities to our urban community. So it's a simple thing, but it's a, it's a critical uh, we need to, to, to progress. I know a lot of people are interested. Yes, we've got to, uh, just um, first of all, you've heard all the different recommendations in this, and I think there are some common pieces in this. One is that each one of them that we recommend continuing as going incorporates a sustainability component. 
some of that is sustainability by developing network features and, and connecting with STEM hubs and uh, connecting those infrastructures that, that eventually build that, the connecting with business partners out there. Um, all of that is, is really engagement. So, so whatever, so I think part of those recommendations is moving towards that. We're trying to provide some recommendations how we can get in that direction. Not to do the Adam and I do forever and ever and ever do the same project. Um, the other thing that's, that I think we've all sort of recognized is this research practice interface, this connection with um, post-secondary education and for a variety of reasons. In some cases, it has to do with um, connection in terms of um, what are the next steps for students. In some cases, connection with um, what kinds of things could we do in terms of uh, interacting with uh, incoming teachers, new teachers, and, or even identifying what are the next phases, what are the next steps to build growth. So that was something that I think was found commonly about what we recommend. The last piece was really um, is something more of a, a wanting than a than it was in any particular recommendation. And uh, Thompson kind of uh, um, talked about this a little bit. Is that there's um, right now what we have is a, is a, a series of projects that that have um, have common kinds of things, but they're coming from us to to provide opportunity for innovation. What what we are looking at is saying, you know, somewhere down the line, we need to really help districts and, and others be able to build that capacity to, to innovate there so that we're coming from the districts. And and there are a variety of models where that needs to happen, but uh, and there are a variety of schools that have tried those models. Yanko County, Yanko County has uh, been working with the model in that sense. Um, and I know uh, I sat in a presentation several years ago um, where Crook County School actually a slightly different model to try to innovate in a much more rapid place. But some of those, some supporting that, supporting the growth of that, I think is going to be critical to be able to build innovation in STEM, um, in STEM space. So those are kind of our three just sort of summary to what some of these recommendations involve. And Sue, uh, the next slide is something. Sue, do you want to capture the, the, the last piece here? Yeah. Um, so just in closing, um, well, the, the four innovation grants uh, definitely differ in focus. Um, their, their approaches and ex experiences have helped us identify and define some shared success indicators um, of, of quality and in, um, investment and um, support. And uh, while the STEM education plan was not published until November, and these RFPs were, were well before that and programs were started, we see direct alignment. Uh, between the indicators listed here and the goals uh, and strategies outlined there. Uh, the four investments have demonstrated that networking educators with uh, high quality professional development resources and each other uh, is a key to promoting sustainable uh, education systems shift and change uh, that motivates and interests students in STEM fields and prepares uh, Oregon students for academic success success and career attainment. And uh, we thank you for for supporting these innovations. This is what we had hoped for. And obviously learning but how we now grow these get scale. Absolutely. So that that's my question is, is in regards to um, our investment portfolio let's call it managing it and turning it over um, we have successes to someone do it long term. Uh, we're not a funding aid. We need to be able to have grant turnover to an agency that should carry on. So if you find a best practice, how, how are we going to advocate and pitch and otherwise make a case to an agency to pick it up and run with it as opposed to keeping our portfolio locked in the same investment here after keeping alive? Right, and, and this is where um, Oregon's approach differs from, from most approaches across the country, is that these uh, the STEM and CTP dollars do flow through um, Department of Education, Higher Education Coordinating Commission. So engaging those agencies uh, in, the, in the management and the understanding and the implementation of these grants, there's natural connectivity happening at the agency level. And uh, Don Huckabee recently uh, uh, hosted a, a conversation across department leads uh, 
come with their names. I'm sorry if that's the wrong name for them. But <laughs> uh, around these investments to share these learnings in preparation for this. And there was a lot of connectivity seen. It's like, oh, but we're doing similar kind of work in school improvement. How could we, you know, and that's the kind of thing that we saw the potential for, for this portfolio to take place at an agency level. And then uh, at the local level, seeing the, the, the impact of these investments, like the math in real life, for example, when educators, when the principals and superintendents see this impact, then they can prioritize funds that they're getting from other sources to also replicate and share and support. And that's what we want to be doing over this next biennium and some of these investments is to get that more intentionality of, of okay, what's the look like? Uh, now, our okay, see those impacts and then fund. Um, yeah, it, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's not a command and control kind no, of a, a no, but thing. It happens I, more organically than that. But yeah. without, if you're vague and fine experience in granting is that the third biennium, they're going to be saying, no, we still need to do another biennium and a fourth biennium. And at yeah. some juncture, we have to put in our criteria for that our outputs to totally. have an end, yep. right? And yep. a handoff to a long-term uh, sustainable. And you'll see from the presentations, I, I hope, that, that in most of those, there was that future vision. You know, 2020, we want to reach a tipping point here. Um, we need to engage COSA in, in terms of understanding uh, this approach and how, you know, computer science is critical. So, so that kind of intentionality for sustainability is very much part of the conversation that is happening. So from a political standpoint, what's the role of this council in regards to pushing, right? Because a lot right. of this is going to be budgetary conversation, prioritization conversation. Yeah, yeah, certainly there's there's that advocate, continued advocacy work um, for this. I think this council has raised, you know, how do we um, engage business and industry throughout the state to be a partner at a local level in support of say, you know, the next generation science standards roll out, how do we work to catalyzing computer science, you know, having industry members being volunteers, how do we look at uh, support for uh, regions that maybe don't have broad industry base, um, at least in, in some of the high needs areas throughout the state, knowing that there's student mobility um, happening across economic regions. Um, so I think there's a lot of additional conversations that we can have um, with this council that, that move beyond um, just a conversation around particular investment, uh, but mobilizing other resources, I guess, um, in the state as well. So looking forward to that. I feel like the other part of this is just the storytelling. Superintendents yeah. that have had the success that are now fully integrated into the opportunities. You need to uh, talk to your motorcycle soon. It's kind of like but, motorcycle, you're racing over there. So. <laughs> but, but I do think it's important for the superintendents to tell about their success stories. And I look at similar to like the CT revitalization grants, or maybe dollars necessary for development to get these programs started up. Once they get going, they can fund themselves. Absolutely. Well, I think that's our role, right? Yeah. To try some things, find some best practices, hand best practices off to somebody actually sustain, grow, and grow. Right. We're not ever going to have a budget. Right. Right. And right. we need to be able to re free up budget so that we can try new things. But there's always that challenge to start out. Yeah. I think having some funds for teacher development or whatever, hardware, whatever it is to get the program started is critical. And that's why we need those kind of initiating funds. When a superintendent gets excited about it, then they say, oh, how do I get it? I can maybe manage it once I get it to scale. But to get to scale, I have some development costs. Right. I don't have that development R and D dollars to get my uh, and and none of the grant managers uh, that I that I'm aware of see this as funding in perpetuity. It's always on their mind about how does this impact the system and how does that handoff occur and how do we accelerate that change so that it actually is is sustainable rather than just the one ups. Education has seen far too many 
one-offs yeah. over the years, and, and everybody's pretty cynical, quite honestly, about, well, is this funding going to be sustained? Why should I put all of this effort in if we can't? And, yes, I need to incorporate it, but they need to see what's the payoff for them in terms of student growth and teacher growth. So it's a... Okay, yeah, and we can continue that aspect in, in item number five on our agenda as we as we wrap up some of this conversation. Okay, the next yeah. next item is post-secondary STEM equities. Marlene, we have a special guest uh, as, mm -hmm. as well, um, with Chasia Clements, who is uh, going as well. Yeah, so I'm... Pyro, council members. I'm I'm here as an agency placeholder. Uh, Cheryl Myers, our HEC representative, couldn't make it, so I'm here to support Marley, who's a very strong grantee uh, and has worked a lot with the other sites as well. So she's going to talk a little bit about it. And Kasia, who's uh, done a capstone project, research project on the site. Yes. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Marley Perez, and I am the director of the Oregon Alliance for Minority Participation. Oregon AM. Um, I do want to point out we are strategically placed under the Division of Undergraduate Studies. So it's not the blend of student leaders and leaders. Um, it also allows us to synergize a little better with the OPTRIO and the academic program as well. Um, I have been managing the Oregon AM grant this year, a project through this grant. So, full disclosure. Um, as one of the grantees, my knowledge of some of the other projects is somewhat limited, but I'll do my best to share. So um, Mark was was kind enough to share with me some of the questions that he possibly would ask for me to address. So to start off, really, was just the grant objective. And simply stated, we were asked to provide innovative activities to recruit and support or get to graduation underserved students um, in STEM at the Oregon Public University. Underserved students for this grant would be specifically defined as racial ethnic minorities. Primarily, a lot of the focus on students was uh, towards Black, Latino, Native, and bilingual. The goal of the grant really was to increase those students' participation, um, degree completion, certificate completion in the STEM field. Um, the strategies that were laid out for us to use are, are linked up there. And I should mention, when I my representation here was a little bit last minute, and so the presentation that I was able to send over in time, um, I did make some new things up there, but, but for the most part, it was the same. Um, the practices that we were asked to use um, or strategies to, to utilize through the grant were extending existing or scaling up um, institutional efforts that were for the institution. Utilizing high impact practices and that would include uh, partnerships between institutions, tutoring and academic coaching, uh, connections to the industry and to research experiences, and building external partnerships outside of just the institution education foundation. Um, and then really trying to collaborate between institutions, uh, trying to approach this rather large goal and objective on our own and, and in silos as, as we tend to do at the uh, realm. Um, in addition, just trying to, to really expand the pipeline into the STEM workforce here in Oregon. Those were kind of the strategies that we were going to do. As far as defining success for these projects and this grant program as a whole, um, I will again put a disclaimer out there. This is kind of my vision and my definition of success for it. Knowing a little bit about the history of the grant that was put forward, um, it was really based on the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation or LSAM program at Dallas, which is funded by the National Science Foundation, part of an alliance. And that's a program that I spent about six years um, developing and, and coordinating before moving to the and so I know it well. And, and knowing that this grant was really built on that and trying to take the stuff that we've experienced in Oregon and follow that into other partners. And I think defining success really looks at these parts and, and increasing the moment for our minorities and our, our underrepresented population um, through recruitment. And I think it's important to point out the, the difference between outreach and, and, and recruitment is always very much focused on juniors and seniors and, people. and, it, and it's specific to colleges, to universities, to program outcome. Uh, 
um, outreach is, is very much focused on prior to that junior year and really uh, engaging in interest, developing uh, confidence and going on to, to higher education and whatnot. And so really focusing on some improvement. Increased persistence and what that would look like is um, retention at the university level or ability to transfer or complete associate degrees at the, at the state college level. But I think that ability to transfer is a big one. It's something that State Oregon towards for a number of years and I think getting a lot better um, in partnering and ensuring a good transition. Obviously, getting more graduates out there, getting them to complete whether they're certificates or the LSA program that I work with really has a long-term goal of then getting more students into PhD pipeline to then return to vision. And I think the end of this piece of success is really a return on investment for you all as a, as a council and really making an impact in my last time workforce that includes your world each year. Talk a little bit about recruitment. Are you also talking about recruitment from the community colleges and the higher ed? Yes. Yeah. I think recruitment really um, needs to focus on all pathways coming in. And so for somebody at the university like myself that's working with high schools, um, unfortunately, that's in-state and out-of-state, right, due to, due to the, the need for funding. Um, but it's also working with community colleges and advising students to help them project their goals, figure out how to get there, and we get into So the alignment with the STEM education plan um, that we have uh, is, is really that Oregon is going to have a, a growing talent shortage, especially in the STEM field. And by 2020, our economy will have about 40,000 people there. Um, I think historically, we have done a lot of work with outreach and to overfill that funnel. And I think that that work is incredibly valuable. Um, but I think what we really need to start focusing on even more, in addition to those outreach activities, we're going to start to meet these goals three years out, because that's really when 2020 is. We need to expand the output at the bottom of the funnel, and that's with that retention. Um, we, I think we've overfilled the funnel with the hopes that statistics, that number would just get bigger at the end. And, and I think we've seen some growth, but if we can re increase the output there, I think we're going to see a much larger impact. Or yield. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yield. And, and maybe a quicker <laughs> return on investment, right? Um, so I apologize for some formatting issues. OSU, our marketing team, requires that we use the big prompts, which are not available to anybody else. Which <laughs> we did. <laughs> right. We, we, we're special. Yeah, we're special to think. Um, so I apologize. Oh, okay. Um Sorry. No, you're fine. So this data is actually something that you've probably seen in the STEM education plan. Um, it was a little hard to understand in the format that it was. And so I think this is a visually impactful. And this is new. I apologize. Um, a visually more impactful uh, chart, and it shows the class of 2006 and, and the outcomes nine years later, as far as where we went from having high school sophomores down to those who completed a STEM credential. Uh, it's important to note that this is not specific to underrepresented minorities, uh, holistic to the population, and so I would imagine that that number is probably even more devastating if we were to uh, narrow it down to, to underrepresented populations. Um, but I think that it really, it, it points to the largest drop being from the enrollment in college to completing a STEM credential. Um, and what that what that does is really indicate us that to invest in retention. Um, I think that it's really important when we look at retention and persistent completion programs that we don't equate underserved or underrepresented with underprepared. I think that happens too often and a lot of times that, that's it. it's just in egos. Absolutely there are students um, that come from those populations that, that enter the college or university environment and they, they are underprepared. But what we've always done with LCAMP and, and what we're doing with Oregon AMP is really trying to focus on community building. Um, and really giving them the support in the community so that if and when they do struggle in classes or, or struggle with not seeing other students that look like them in a, in a chemistry freshman class of 500, that they have a community to go back to and they feel supported and they don't necessarily feel like uh, I think keeping that in mind as we go through each of the programming. Um, so connecting to industry and really giving students somebody to look to and understand that that's where they uh, What I found with students working with some students for the better part of 
career is that a lot of students come in and they have an idea that they just want to be a doctor. That's what they're familiar with. I'm going to get a biology degree or chemistry degree. I'm going to go to med school and have a bit. And then they realize that's a lot of work and a lot of time. And they end up leaving biology and chemistry and going outside of STEM because they don't know what else they do. And so really connecting students to Oregon, educating them about the different career pathways that they really don't know about as a high school student. They need to be that. Um, exposing them to research, um, obviously uh, offering some consistent support to get them through their, their college experience and then writing some programs from the colleges uh, into universities. A lot of the, uh, the strategies mentioned in the STEM education plan are things that Oregon and the project have done well in the program. Um, we have really tried to foster environment that's and not in our own need help or can't make it, but really meeting them when they get to you can do this and this is your and let's let's put it together. Um, and I think that's been really important. And then just providing those opportunities. Yeah. So I do want to highlight a few of the projects that were funded this this grant. Uh, the grant, I believe, was a total of $2 million, and it was for uh, just over a year, 13 months, so an interesting timeline. Um, and I, I, what I believe to be the goal of this grant was to really fund some pilot programs around the state that better retain uh, for minority students. Um, OHSU and the on-track program, which I believe probably a lot of you are familiar with and want to hear more about, um, used this grant to scale up what they were already doing able to reach another population for Oregon. So we're already doing a lot of work around the state is to um, try to increase the number of students at that level that they to the biological field um, here in Oregon. Uh, according to their their mid project um, for a, their impact on the On the persistent side, uh, PCC, the Slovenia campus, um, started a cohort of engineering physics chemistry students uh, that we're using some different NSF proven strategies to support students who persist out with faculty capable. So addressing students and supporting them through that, um, that exploration, um, offering tutoring with faculty and students, and then really engaging students consistent cohort that allow them to go through seminars and address different workshop topics that could really uh, help them in college. And finally, I, of course, I'm going to highlight my own program at OSU, which is the Oregon Alliance for Minority Participation. Um, you have a sheet in front of you, a handout that is, is two-sided. One side talks about the conference data, but the other side talks more about our program impacts. It was a three-pronged uh, project. Number one, we were looking at expanding our supports for second-year students, OSU, university, nationwide, and historically have done a good job addressing first-year experience. Um, but you see a huge drop off of that second year work going into the third year. So we wanted to try to address that with our population developed that program, which breaks students into a number of themes. Really crazy and fun. Um, but we've seen an 88% retention rate of those students in STEM at OSU in all program. So that's, that's great. Just a question. We got a presentation a while back, a couple years ago, on the Bridge program. Is yep. one of the same? That was me, yep. It's one of the same. Just call it a different She's name. one in the same. So, it's a little bit different. The Bridge Program was a first year program and it was residential, 10 days right before school starts. And that's only 60 students. And we still run that. Um, that averages around a 90% retention in STEM first year. So, that's so this good. is a continuation. This is that, a continuation, continuation of that yeah. off of that, that same community kind of trend. Same community building, um, addressing some more issues around um, personal growth and leadership. Uh, academic preparedness, getting connected to industry, research, and uh, just trying to connect to a not residential and runs about the whole year. You have that. So you guys are having better success tracking having freshmen hiring for engineering and following them all the way through as opposed to just waiting until they get posted. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and engineering is a large chunk of our students. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have. We've seen just a a higher retention rate when we give these on to get through each of the point. So as so you fundamentally shifted their how they're taking on engineering students, there wasn't an engineering degree for freshmen. No. You're, you're undeclared basically. You um you do declare into a pre major, 
for the first two years, and then um, they've done some work expanding uh, capacity at the pro school level to, to accommodate more students. That was my next question. Yeah, if, you're, if you're retaining more kids, they're not restricting. They're not restricting. They're not restricting. Not as much as they used to. Yeah, as much no, as yeah. Much lower. They, yeah, they've they've maintained a uh, more standard GP level rather than a moving target each year that was based on the number of students. They got this GPA, they got in automatically. Yeah. I suppose, oh, you made the GPA, but the, Sorry, we don't have the line higher because, yeah. Because, yeah. And I think it's important to point out for us, um, we have about 1,700 students that are also eligible at <coughs> OSU, and engineering is about 40 of them. So we're really serving five different STEM colleges there. We're looking for students, agriculture sciences, science, um, earth, ocean, and atmosphere. Yeah, I was just asking about engineering, yeah. history of the difficulty of tracking engineering student <laughs> system. And we've seen really good outcomes and impacts for our specific uh, population. Also. So um, we don't do much with that. The student groups at OSU, what I've come to find, are very uh, volatile and they ebb and flow. And so there are years where they're very strong and um, representative, and then there are years where they go up and really um, uh, The groups that we have worked with over the years our NESBY, National Society of Black and Chef, kind of question on there's um, Manners, which is Minority Research Sciences. Um, more recently, Staffness, which has um, been energized about the last couple of years. And then there's a few other uh, homegrown student organizations that have been um, in the report. But, but um, we've really treated LSAM as kind of its own community and trying to then point students to those uh, to those opportunities outside of our, our. Uh, The second part of our grant, the second prong, if you will, was trying to build industry relationships. And there's a list on, on out of industry partners that we hope to grow that. Um, we were able to bring students to a lot of different industry quarters, which was nice to get them on starting to understand the different careers that were available for them. Um, we even explored over into Bend area, which really should be one of the there. So trying to build um, that connection through site visits, the conference, and the workshops on campus. And then the third piece was really laying the foundation for what we call a Center for Excellence. And this is based off of the Midwest Center for Excellence um, that is run by an LCM person in Illinois or Indiana. They kind of work together and hand that off. And they work work to help and assist non lsam universities and community colleges to get programming on campuses, seek out grant funds, um, and consult with them on things that we know. And our impact at OSU has been seven. So uh, there were nine projects that were funded with this $2 million for the year. Uh, these were the numbers served that were reported on their mid-project grant, or uh, mid-project reports that were submitted last month. Uh, Final reports would be in August 1st. So I think the key findings that, that have come up throughout this year is that our collaboration is really crucial for, for these programs to succeed. I think it points to the need for an alliance model and, and really identifying a lead institution to, to take on um, some of the guidance, uh, whether that's providing direction to programs and helping them find other um, agencies to fund them, whether that's looking at sharing data between all of them, and even just communicating. That's been something that was difficult this year. There wasn't anybody really in charge of all of the projects that could come and say, let's all continue to collaborate. We hosted a, a summit in the fall, which is helpful, to learn about all the projects and try to identify uh, collaboration. But it's funny to participate in even that role would be helpful. Um, sharing best practices with consultation, and I think that's the part that leads to more effective partnerships. One of the projects that we've engaged is on the end of is the University of Oregon. And they do not have a project funded by this grant program, but they recently were awarded a rather large donation from my family to expand their, uh, expand their STEM initiatives on this. And so they have reached out to Oregon AMP and that quite a bit to try to help them identify the challenges that they have on their campus, the fulfillment of these targeted populations, how to better support them. Um, and then we found that the conference, the Orient conference, was really an impactful experience. On data is on the side of that, that sheet for a lot of students, I think, really provided their um, 
sense of belonging in the STEM field and the level forward. So I I know that Mark wanted me to address kind of the impact of what we think moving forward in best science a little bit, I think, to what you all were talking about previous to this. And this is just an example. I think with a lot of programs that are focused on retention, persistence, and communication, you don't see a large impact in the data in the first year. The numbers served are, are great to see, but I think the data, we don't see that in on uh, year six. And so uh, this is an example of when we were first funded in Alsan in 2009, we saw a little bit of a jump initially and then a flat line. But over the next five years, for a total of six years, we saw a huge that increase really outpaced OSU's total growth at the moment. Yeah. Like, um, additionally, I think this shows that even more when you're looking at completion programs, these were our degrees earned for minority STEM students, again, um, was funded. I don't think that you can get these outcomes, whether it's on the enrollment side or the degree completion side, by just focusing on something that really indicates a strong level of retention programming because we're not just adding to the pressure every year, continuing to keep more of that software um, moving forward. And so I think that that demonstrates even more so that sometimes that longer term startup funding is beneficial to people. So the long term investment goals that I, I would see for this uh, for this grant is to really um, have some time to get some demonstrated success in graduation data. Um, I think with investment in some of these programs, that gives us the opportunity to focus on obtaining long-term funding outside of that investment, also outside of, of ODE tech. Um, a really great example of this is when we first got our LSA grant, they required us to have a bridge program, but they didn't pay for it. So I made the grant. Um, Intel was kind enough to fund our bridge program for the first few years, and that gave us enough time to get really great data on the potential of those students, to then take our, to our president and our deans and provost and say, hey, what we're doing has worked. Now it's your turn to step up. And, and lucky for us, we have President Ray and kind of looking to money and fund this. It's leadership. That's, give, that's what it yeah. takes. That's and and give, give her your money. And I, we're obviously very thankful for that. But I think um, allowing these types of programs some time to get that startup going and get that data is really helpful. Um, what's your retention? What's the retention rate you're seeing? So 1,700 kids enter that are in authority. What's the out? What's the yield back in right now? So you estimate. Yeah, I haven't seen um, the most recent graduation numbers. Uh, I believe we were around 240 most recent year, and so we, we our baseline when we wrote the grant was 76, but about eight or nine years. Back. Initially, the goal of the the Elson grant in the first five years to double the number of degrees granted in five years. So we had to focus on that that impact coming out. Um, the year-to-year -year retention definitely varies on, on cohort, um, but the first year and the second year are really all we have so far. And essentially, yeah, looking at, at institutional money through tuition dollars generated other um, federal programs through NSH, or NSF, NIH, DOE, and then really trying to bridge the gap between higher education and state Oregon. The so recommended action to be a continued investment in the proven and impactful retention education programs through academic education. Um, I think the goal for this this program was really to utilize this first year as a pilot and determine successful and impactful and then move forward with that work with some funding just for one to two biennials and then leaving it up to them to really find uh, funding to. I will say that I, I have been in multiple talks with program directors at NSF um, talking about trying to get Oregon AMP uh, funded long term through NSF in a similar fashion to the West Center that, that is funded. And they're excited about the possibility of having one in Oregon West Coast. Um, and we're working towards that, but that funding is like working out just because of funding. But it's something that's on their radar and we're working towards. Um, and, and really just formalizing Oregon AMP and using that to share best practices together to um, create consistent communication with all of the projects start to collect uh, more data in a couple of years and really continue to enhance those partnerships. What is the HEX role in all this? Are they, are they pushing the school? 
regards to are they measuring this and having a report card associated with this? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't believe it's time. Yeah, Mark and I. But they're still waiting for the final report. Yeah, the so numbers. they have final reports where they'll have projected impact and how they make that their deliverables. But I, as far as specific outlined outcomes, I'm not aware. I know this I mean, was besides the goals of the topic at when OUS was around, right? They talked about this benefit number that and Bell Shell and it's still at so I'm just now with the attendance of each institution I'm just concerned of how do we how do we get this yeah. thing to yeah. you know if there's any work with what? Do you know if there's any work with the boards? I I know that the equity there's some equity conversation that will happen. It's probably better communication for I will say one of the concerns kind of I think from all of the projects that I've heard is that we are one of the programs that have not been granted a no cost question to continue to, to spend on spent money through the summer. Um, and then not knowing what the outcome of the budget session is until after the grant ends. So really trying to find ways to not lose that momentum with all of the projects that are you said greater coordinating the process yeah. because there's other funding in the system through federal funding right. and stuff that, that the coordination is like. Just at Oregon State, what do you think the cost of that? Um, as far as like how much is everybody done, chipping in, right? I mean, yeah. How much is, the um, LSAM program, uh, we get maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year for that for that grant, and then the university chips in about another ninety five. That's just for for Elfand. Um <laughs> to the value. You're, yeah, you're not uh, cheap. You're, yeah, you're, you're, you have well, good value. <laughs> <laughs> good value. That's good value. That's good return on your investment. Yeah. <laughs> um, Oregon Amp with the idea of kind of being a leader in the state and really trying to work with all of um, other partners and, uh, was around that budget on a couple thousand. But we did do some great work uh, raising money to involve our sponsors. Thank you for the opportunity to present my team. My name is Taja Clement, I graduate from Oregon. I worked with the Odai Big Shop. We took a look at this grant like took an approach that looked at the story and I was Uh, as Marley mentioned, uh, nine sites this month of our particular study project that like just community college um, yeah. and Jamaica the Jamaica completely created actual organized technology already high school program. But it was expanded to three. And then at the point of we just an already And that's the OIT and Clint. Yeah, yes. uh, and Wilson. And Wilson. So Wilson. it included both. both. Uh, so with our and also just various approach of interview, phone interview, focus station, also an online. And we also were able to that work that I mentioned. We're going to share with you the promising practices that our research has, uh, the things that we First promising practice is hands on activity. Really getting those kids, building robots, drawing drawing maps out, you know, creating projects. And going hand in hand with that is getting them in there at a young age. 
keep them that follow up with each other, not just having it like a one, but having multiple opportunities to get involved. We had peer and professional mentorship in my degree, and those were important not only to support the kids while they were in the but without having them to the Providing resources to perform food, travel, funding libraries, and also just uh, providing kids with information about aid and the same programming is also not just having a one time event, but having uh, a program that there for the same. And finally, we found that multiple methods just having one one outreach of them um, for example, spoke to one student that she received an email about the program and she had met them but as soon as she got the phone call really reached out for her, that's what she um, it's it's nice to focus just on the promise but of course there were challenges These are really the big highlights of those challenges. Um, the first challenge was the grant fund came in May, and for some sites that was a problem. Um, for one site, they started someone building three and a half to get a hundred students. So that was quite a um, The second was retention student employee. A lot of these programs use an employee tutor or to provide other services. Um, but those particular positions often have very low hours and difficult to get And the final challenge that we found was just the constraints of the fund. But it, as she said, it's only a 13 month cycle. So just a lot of uncertainty about what's going on. So now I'd like to share three particularly powerful stories. The first student story came from a mother who reached out to the program teacher. She described her son as struggling and drawing and just not feeling like he was. This is what she said after. She said the impact was dramatic. Instead of continuing to withdraw, the program pushed him into a the second story comes from a student, a female member. The first, uh, in her family, she said, this program, after enrolling in the program, I am doing the right thing at the right time, and I'm not moving. And the final story comes from a student who was involved in the clinical shadow experience. Um, he described, that I always said that I wanted to be a doctor, but this gave me the confidence that, for sure, I love this. This is right. And these student stories really show that they're solidifying that confidence, solidifying that idea for what program. So, yeah, the report is going to have, and they are going to be their overall. And I'll also be presenting the question. Have the three kids have the paper at the heck with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one question I do have, and I, I mean, um, it seems like everyone went off and did their own thing. You have a program that's already producing really great results. Why are we inventing the wheel? I mean, is there, is there that much difference in all these programs that being put together? I know you may have a bias on this, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it just seems like you found something that's working. We're wasting dollars on designing programs versus delivering out. So. I do, um, and I think that was the intention of, of this grant program. And in the RFP, it was very, very directly referenced the, the research that was done on a national level. So that's not just quest. Um, and as we got together, I think at the summit, we started to realize the stark difference between projects, and, and that is the reason for. Um, our own project only engaging with some of the other projects because the alignment seemed a little natural for those. Um, I think that 
a, a larger vision moving forward would be to um, streamline what the projects would be doing and come up with a more um, narrow set of goals and outcomes that would kind of keep people in that lane. I think you guys have learned what works. Let's beat that to death, and we don't have to reinvent the time. I know what works. It's a tricky okay. regional leadership. <laughs> maybe that's something, maybe that's not, hopefully you talk about that at HEC so that they can. Whose money they're spending. If they're spending their own money, they're going to do their own thing. Yeah. If they're spending someone else's money, they might not. So if we have to do any more in this granting area yeah. to do this, I think I want to insist yeah. that, that, that we take what's work and use and maybe can do some a little improvement, but let's not reinvent the Yeah, I, I really, I think I see the huge difference, obviously. There's the regional schools, and the populations are different, and the community college to the four-year school is an obvious difference. We can obviously four-year school. Yeah, okay. like OHSU. Yeah. But um, within those subgroups, there should be some content, say, to Jim's point of, of scale and and certainly the promising practice out of the LSAM project yeah. are infinitely, I mean, they're scalable. Yeah. Build community, make those connections, early opportunities to engage in applied learning yeah. and research. The number and one issue I think we have with all these types of programs is but and obviously I've seen the uh, I've been involved in higher education where budgets get squeezed. They're often one of the very first things that get a limit. So we look at the return on investment. And it's the right thing to do. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so Thank much you for your work on this. And uh, we'll get some feedback from how the meeting went in heck. <laughs> <laughs> and in depth, we're going to have to be. What's fine? Are you doing break or not? No, we're, All right. we're at 11.30, man, so so we're going to be, we're going to take a break. Very okay. Break. Okay. Stretch, stretch, five minutes? Stretch. Five minutes, stretch. Stretch. <laughs> stretch down the hall. <laughs> we're squirming. No worries. We'll be quick. Okay. I won't give it.
Okay, we're back on. Thank you. Great. Totally got my Everyone feels refreshed and see that's an old presentation trick. Go right after a break. People are all all right, Chrissy. We're raring to go. Hey, all right. Dollar investment in the hub. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go. Is that the pressure turning on? Uh, good afternoon, Chair Pyro, Council members. Um, we're pleased to talk a little bit about the STEM hub investment. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to go through a ton of background because you guys know this. Um, but I do want to just, before I'll let um, Deb talk in a minute, um, I want to just alert you to what you have in your packet. So you have a two-pager, which you've seen before, which is all the details. So if you want numbers served, all of those pieces, we don't have to go through each of those, but those are there for you to look at. We also have, obviously, the PowerPoint and then um, a document of our continuous improvement process that we're going to talk a little bit more about in depth, but I wanted you to be able to reference that and really sort of get a picture of what that process looks like. So that's in there for you. Um, next week. Great. So um, we're all familiar with our investment strategy. We had backbone program expansion, network development. You know, we have regions across states. We have the first cohort and second cohort, totaling 11. Go ahead. Um, so we just wanted to, you know, open this as sort of even more of a discussion as we move through. So feel free to chime in. Uh, but obviously with this investment, you know, we've had so many successes, but we just wanted to upfront say, what are the major tensions right now? Um, we have a few things, right? So uh, this being a major investment um, of the Council of the Legislature is balancing being supportive with community and accountability systems. So we know we need to be attentive to our return on investment and good public stewards of um, public funds. Uh, but we also want to sort of create, a, you know, a relationship with grassroots movements and things that are happening at the regional level and be supportive of that. So that's one tension. Uh, the second um, is biennial funding challenges. And, of course, um, with that comes the maintenance of leadership and momentum moving across. So talk a little bit about the work that we're doing. And the, the department is really doing a great job to try to smooth that out. Um, the third is sort of this view as the hubs is, Either are we program provider or are we community partnership? And I think, you know, what we've seen with a mix of, <clears throat> of these investments that it's sort of been both. Um, and actually, uh, some of the stuff I've been seeing is there may be a real complementary nature to that when you have high-level leadership at the table, but you also have people on the ground closest to the work implementing programs sort of connecting together around this work, that um, that might be something that's beneficial and not necessarily need to be so dichotomized. Um, so uh, because we're focused today on sort of where we move forward, how we're going to sort of assess these investments, being a, a large investment, I wanted to talk a little bit about our monitoring strategy and our continuous improvement process. So uh, many of you are familiar. Um, we had a couple of years of looking at trying to identify outcomes for the hubs, you know, systems change initiatives, so it's always um, a little bit amorphous than your typical retention, high school graduation rates, and we have all those with the STEM ed plan, but we know that with these partnership strategies, that's, you know, a lot, a very long-term thing, and being, you know, year two in some of these investments, year four in some of these, we might have some inclinations with those may be impacted, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so what we've been working on is taking all that work, you know, with hub leadership and with other sort of collaborative collective impact leaderships uh, in the state, thinking about uh, what are our metrics, what are our targets, um, and really trying to develop a process that makes sense at the local level on sort of a continuous improvement standpoint and gives us some accountability. So we walk a really thin line, right? So what we're trying to do is be supportive of continuous improvement at the same time as we're implementing, you know, a monitoring accountability piece, which, which you know, there can be some difficulty there, but I think um, we're piloting a process that Deb's going to talk to you a little bit more about that I think uh, has potential uh, as we move it forward. 
Um, the other thing I just wanted to note here is uh, this continuous improvement process is also sort of serving as our uh, mechanism for continuation of funds and conti uh, continued continuous improvement plans so that we don't have separate RFP processes. What we've heard from the field is here, fill out three different RFPs throughout the region, and that's half of their job is filling out RFPs and reports and really trying to, the department's done a really good job at um, working with us to try to smooth that out. So as Deb talks through that, just recognize this is continuous improvement, accountability, and the funding mechanism for the next year. So we're doing a lot at once, streamlining, <laughs> but you know, it's a pilot, so we know we can always improve as we move things forward. So Deb's going to talk a little bit about the process. Okay, thank you. And that is the document that you have in your packet there. Is This was sent out to all of the hubs. And um, as we try to move away from that competitive RFP process um, for those RFP ratings that, as you said, are trying to walk that fine line, um, we're moving to this more continuous um, improvement process. And so as we have moved towards that, we've asked the hubs to go through a very rigorous uh, timeline with us. And can move forward there. Um, you can see that the timeline that we've asked the hubs to follow on page three of your document. This was a very um, fast process for them. So um, we thank them for all of their hard work and getting all, us all of the evidence for us to review in this continuous improvement process. Um, the evidence that we asked to gather, um, it is listed in your packet there as well, but you can see it on the slide. Um, we were asking for partnership plans and, and communications, things like that. There's a whole list of items that we were asking. We were either able to populate that information for the hub. Um, so for example, we had a copy of their partnership plan and we compiled that all into a Google file. And then there were other items that the hubs themselves had to populate that Google file for us. And they had certain deadlines that we asked them to follow for that. You can see that on page seven of the, the packet there. So from all of that evidence, we took this and um, we had an internal team between ODE and the Chief Education Office and assessed all of that evidence. Um, this was the assessment rating rubric, which is on page five in the packet there, that we followed. Um, uh, thriving, functioning, developing, and requires intervention. One of the things that we decided as a team is that if a hub received a requires intervention in any one of the seven indicators, that would be a requirement for them to work on that as a focus area plan. So, Functioning and then developing, we, we actually anticipate that many of the cohort two hubs would fall into the developing area uh, as to be expected, um, but you can look at the next slide there. These were the preliminary ratings right now. We are actually right in the midst of this process. Um, I'm working on scheduling phone calls with all of our hubs so we can set up a time where we can assess both our rating and their rating. So they did a self-assessment of the same seven indicators and then we, as the internal team between ODE and Chief Ed, we assess those seven indicators as well. And actually, we, we've already had one phone call so far, and we did let the hub know that, um, surprisingly, we did not look at the hub's um, self-assessment before, you know, while we were assessing. And we only then looked at their assessment once we had assessed it. So it was kind of a blind. And a rate of reliability. Exactly. And your so, indicators are on page six. Uh, and those are what's on the left hand of the graph. And as you can see, um, you know, I know Eric, you mentioned earlier about that sustainability uh, concept of these, uh, are we going to go from each biennium to I mean, one more biennium, one more biennium. But that is one of the indicators that we're looking for is that ability to sustain themselves um, in the future. So, yeah, uh, any questions on, um, these are, again, preliminary results. Oh, you can go back there. Um, they're aggregated. Um, there's no um, identifying information there. Um, we're, like I said, we're working with the hubs to kind of um, have negotiation, meaning making around these scores. If, if they were very uh, different between the internal review and the hub self-assessment, we, we plan to have conversations around those and move forward to, to help them then develop a continuous improvement plan with action steps um, moving forward. Three counties that are some hubs, I'm, I form a hub or 
ไว้นะครับเขามีเงินเดือนเยอะทำไมมาร์กอยู่นะเทคโนโSo what we've talked about is, you know, thinking about the continuous improvement process as, you know, that's part of the reason why we have this rating system and the continuous improvement plan. You know, we're hoping to continue funds, but we also know that the ecosystems are going to evolve, and there's some natural, you know, boundary lines that continue to evolve. And we've talked about, um, you know. Obviously, assessing the continuation of funds of the hubs, but also looking at potentially, depending on funding levels, opening a process uh, potentially in the fall for you know one to three hubs to connect and build, where there's innovative partnerships going on and some healthy competition. To build. We we'll note that between cohort one and cohort two, we had uh, provided state support and engagement for those. Uh, communities that wanted to learn alongside the funded hubs, and that demonstrated uh, increased partnerships and commitment to the work, and we see particularly in in hubs with uh, from Northwest ESD a commitment of the last year and a half um, to invest in um, personnel, to invest in partnership development, uh, and engagement alongside the other funded STEM hubs. So that community in particular. Has been prioritizing this work, and we've tried to been be very open about bringing the meetings and letting them learn. So, great. Um, the one thing I I will mention about this graph is so uh, as you might recall, a new and piece of the investment that we included this year was really support around collaborative governance and leadership um, with Oregon Solutions. Um, out in the field, and if you notice, a lot of the stronger things that folks have scored on are um, some of the participatory governance and collaborative leadership, um, and uh, the strategic alignment. Things that we really, um, you know, it's also to the hub's credit, but also uh, I think that those supports have been helpful in the field, and I think. The the ones that you know everybody has, is struggling with, particularly the data led continuous improvement process or continuous improvement pieces. That is not isolated to this. It's happening with the early learning hubs. It's happening with the racks. Everybody struggles with this, and so some targeted supports. This is really sort of representative. We'll be able to assess as agencies sort of where we would need to target based on process. But, um, yeah. Yeah, and just to the to the point back on the slide, and I know this is a question that the council has, has raised several times, but part of the requires intervention is that accountability piece, and to ensure that the hubs are making progress and committing to improving in those areas, and so um, that will be progress in that regard. Will uh, funding will be contingent on on progress in those areas. Okay, great. So, really briefly, you all know because they presented, I believe, one or two council meetings ago, uh, that we also, in addition to our internal uh, evaluation work and assessment work, we have an external, two external partners, OSU and Epic, providing us with a report that's actually coming mid June. <laughs> um, so, I pulled a couple graphs for them that I won't belabor on, but that sort of celebrate. Uh, some of the work, and then I look forward to getting you guys that report coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, so just super briefly, since we're running out of time, this is uh, from, they supported the hubs in implementing a partner, partner survey. Uh, this was sort of the assessment of partners that STEM hubs were pro progressing towards their goal. Uh, as you can see, uh, most had satisfactory or exemplary, exemplary progress if you aggregate on a whole throughout the system. Um, all of the partners that participated in the survey. Um, uh, one of these other questions that was, I think, important is the perspective of the partners that the STEM Hub was actually developing sort of as a healthy network, a healthy community, and that partners felt like that they could contribute. Um, and as you can see, we have some neither disagree or, or agree. We have many strongly in the agree to strongly agree category. Um, so it's important that we see partners actually valuing the work in the community.
So big one, numbers, you guys like this one. Uh, <laughs> so uh, as you recall, one of our target indicators was sort of ratio of leveraged funds. Uh, and what we did was we implemented a pilot, and I'm going to stress pilot, tracking system for hubs to start filling out sort of where their sources of funding are. We know that in sustainability, we want to see a diversity of funding sources, um, and as well as funds leveraged uh, within the site. Um, so as you can see on this side, cohort one STEM hubs, um, aside from the hub funding, have leveraged uh, 6.4 million in uh, funding and in-kind support, so human resources as well as financial resources. Cohort 2 STEM hubs, we have obviously a little, quite a bit lower, 695,000 about. Um, what I see from this is that, you know, cohort 1 is about, you know, four years in plus, and cohort 2, many of them are sort of one, two years under the belt, you know, really ramping up, and so while it's much less, I see that there's possibility for them to sort of get to that cohort one stage, which is why we sort of broke it out this way. And I assume grants have no stake. No. Yeah, no. Nope. Okay, nope. no, I just to yep. make sure we're not building. No, nope. we made sure that we said, what are the state funds that you're getting and what are the other funds that you're getting? Um, so, you know, hopefully those will increase over time, so but. It's critical that we, I mean, I can yep. believe it or not, but. Um, I believe it. <laughs> it's critical that we um, look at the other state funding, take that out of some of the conversations we have and really focus on the other leverage dollars. The other state funding from a functional standpoint mm -hmm. inside this room is great. You know, go out and figure out how to leverage it. But when you go talk to the legislators and you talk to leaders, you really ought to focus on new money, right? And, and right. really push hard that we're having success. So we have a so ratio that we're say going- say double, right? Double, whatever, whatever yep. that number is that we want to yep. get to at least half of what they puts in or whatever the case may be. I think there's two storylines there, and yours, that one is for sure one. I think in terms of building a functional system where we're getting the network and we have these complementary grants rather than one-off grants, yeah. math in real life probably wouldn't be as successful without the hubs. The computer science and digital literacy, STEM Beyond School, they've relied on that connectivity at the regional level to, to really coordinate and to find the leaders and to sustain that leadership and to perpetuate communication across the network. So I don't want to lose that no. piece. Well, and the in other interesting piece of that is these are not only innovation grants. We see a lot of communities will have leverage like college and career readiness grants or career pathways that you know, move with CTE, you know, we and a lot of those communities, because they're sort of developing these partnerships and they already have relationships in place they're able to like be actually competitive in those state grants because they already have it all there. They don't have to go and develop all the new relationships. So that is a piece of the story. I think we're gonna just want some detail associated with other state funding, make sure that we're not, yeah. And the other part of this is ranchers and partner support, they gotta see out. And critical that they feel like they're getting their return on their investment. All Absolutely. Of grants, we're a rancher, we wanna make sure they get value. Well, I'm sure they yeah. can show that ROI and get the outcome. Right? Well, I think you bring up an interesting point because as we see other investors coming to the table and the diversity of funds being leveraged, um, we really need to think well about how those funders are talking to each other or how you know that creates some difficulties or just challenges at the local level and really blending and braiding funds together with multiple funders, expectations, and different funding streams. And, I, you know, I think, you know, a good part of being a more partnership in a region is a value in that is to be able to be the people who help braid those together. So, but, so uh, just to wrap up with a couple key learnings. Uh, we know local leadership is really important, um, particularly we see the hub leaders as, as really important to the success and development, especially those that, you know, have capacity around community development and partnership development. How's the turnover so far? You know, we have leaders. A couple, but not bad, actually. I don't know the rate in my head, but probably, what, one or two have left up? Yeah, I think this is this required this Two. this one was really referencing those key champions in mm -hmm. in regions, not just the hub 
you know, no leader, but, uh, but, it, but uh, the leader, you know, takes a substantial no, leader I mean, to move this forward. They're just forward. getting up to speed and they depart. Absolutely. Right. Love Absolutely. Love. We've lost two um, for various reasons. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we're working really hard on the funding models. It's super important to implementation. It causes a lot of struggles. We all know this. Um, again, balancing flexibility of funding while maintaining accountability is going to be important in thinking about the investment in the future. We want uh, targeted supports to strengthen areas of, you know, difficulty in the regions. Um, and again, they continue in, to involve and we want to help strike a balance of stability but also with some healthy competition. And I've put just some questions up here for you. I realize we're running short on time, um, but take any questions. Uh -huh. Any questions for people on the phone? Well, unlike some of the innovation grants that we do, this is an area where I believe that we do need to maintain ownership and budget, that we do need to be the sole advocate for and, and making sure that the base funding for the hubs, whatever that's determined to be appropriate, is stays within this council because if it doesn't, I'm concerned about something. The other thing, and obviously we'll see this in the evaluation, but their ability of the hub to drive change and partners, people want to see change in themselves. At some point, if they don't see change, why am I? Got to continue to drive change and see the outcome, feel the success of what do. People use that. Sure the partners are all valued strategy. successors Look forward to the uh, evaluation. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll keep in mind something I think we are supportive of. Love to see Lynn Benton. I mean, there's a, a peer support Oregon State, one of our yeah. <laughs> biggest areas. Of, They've been in many conversations yeah, so, with us. Yeah. So. I mean, yeah. Columbia County, obviously, their new, uh, digital, new uh, advanced manufacturing center there, another critical player. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you. We look thank forward you. to the evaluation. And, uh, all right. Um, we are running, out of running a little short of time, but I think keeping, um, you know, there's, we could either talk about additional priorities. I think it, it, time may be better spent Know, getting the council's thoughts on 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 staying the course and the other places that uh, you know are, are potentially needing um, some some targeted investments. What are your thoughts right now on the portfolio? What you've heard uh, here today and have seen over the last couple of years as we tried to bring the grantees to this council so you can hear the, the work firsthand. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts? of initial recommendations knowing that once the budget comes out we'll have to reconvene and, <laughs> and, and, and get some additional um, input from y'all. Oh, we just go around and just carry through your thoughts. Oh, yeah, put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nobody gets to say ditto. Okay. Uh, I guess the, 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 the main one in regards to the current STEM investments that I've got long-term concern of that I discussed at the time was computer-based adaptive math. Um, of just trying to understand what kind of impact we have with it and the amount of money that it's taking. Um, so that would be the, the one I would want to look further into. Uh, you know, the, there's some, like the computer science piece, that I think has just now got its legs starting to get under it. So having you know, additional uh, results, critical. I, I really feel most of these deserve a second biennium, but with very specific results that have to be met by the end of the second buy-in, or even the third year of the funding, uh, to continue. Um, it's, the, it's the hard decision to have to make at some point. Some lines have to be met um, so that we don't find ourselves in being a sustaining funder for long-term funding. Well, you know, from the very beginning, we always talk about our, talk about our strategy we call it um, very basically practice. 
programs that would ultimately be able to and I, I think that that's kind of our black hole point how do we create this sustainable ecosystem that leverage again we're at that I obviously we had had some success the question is is, is that success basically well I always look at this in the three phases first the prototype second architect third you scale. Can you is it possible for us as we move into this from a prototyping phase into an architecting phase to say what does this look like when it gets replicated? Replication is the hardest part. It's harder than the actual prototype. And so can we actually be intentional about architecting something that is replicatable but ultimately can have that supporting infrastructure around it that we can scale so I think that to look at it within the three-tier process is very important. And if we don't, what happens is you spin up prototypes that are flashing them. And that's the risk that we that we're actually using. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that all community organizations. Lisa, are you still on the phone? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, and so I, I continue to be excited about how the STEM Hub pieces are coming together. I'd like to see how we can thread the needle on things that are working well at one, how we help translate that across, you know, to the earlier comments about scaling some of these things. Um, and to what Eric said earlier, making sure this council stays very close on the funding there. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I have for today. There's just so much good data and metrics coming back. It's, it's helpful. It, It'll help make the decision making, I think, a little bit easier as we have to make hard decisions. Yes. One question would be, as a goal, do we want to create some slack in our budget, no matter what we get, say, June 30th, July 8th or 11th, or special session, um, <laughs> to be able to do something new in this upcoming biennium? And that, that means we have to make some decisions for that slack. Yep. Even if it's a haircut across the board, or if it's a limitation of one, two, The last two still on the phone. Her? Are they still on? They may be muted. It's awesome. Her? Her, do you have any thoughts? I guess my only thought, and, and I think we're seeing in places, as I said it before, is how do we get this, how do we get those success stories out there so we can get the superintendent and others to have a push and pull effect. I think leadership is critical here when people see the success of the path in there. I just think that's part of our scaling strategy. Gotta to get people at the top end to the value for students, school boards and others to say this is what we expect for our kids. I saw the example down in Eugene. What those kids were experiencing, you say, wow, how, why aren't we providing that experience to all kids? I think if superintendents want to, it can be a driving force, it can also be an impediment to change. Not that I want to blame them, but school boards and stuff. Getting the superintendents to see how they can create a different experience for their kids, a driving force to change behavior in school. You gotta have teachers who want to do it, but you gotta have someone at the top to uh, help push it along. So if we made any requests to for an audience at our meetings, I mean they have a school board and it, Yeah, we've we presented a couple of times to COSA and presenting again around the STEM Hub initiative, the regional initiatives. I think um, ODE has presented several times at COSA, the OSA, the school board association. But I think we could we could elevate that a little bit more and, and get highlight the specific grantees in those conversations and have their voices 
um, advocating from peer to peer. There's nothing like a teacher talking to another teacher or a principal talking to another principal. That's where it starts to propagate. As you know, Thompson, very well, it's, it's yeah, okay, but the state's always going to say that. Oh, yeah, but that's industry. They're going to say that, of course. But when it's your, you know, a peer that, that it's very highly um, regarded and it's happened, they're going to say, yeah, it was hard, but this was the magic moment. And just stick with it. Take the leap. And, and creating those conditions for the, the change to, I mean, for them to take risks in a system that's really risk averse. The other area that I, and I don't know where it fits in here, and I don't want to call it science in real life, but, science I, real life. <laughs> but, but I do think as we think about the CTE programs in Measure 98, and we heard it down in Eugene, how do we ensure the integration of CTE and STEM together, and it's not just one size, it's not welding, it's welding and science and, and math integrated, and how do we help that? I know it's kind of like math in real life, but we're going to see some CTE programs proliferate. And uh, we want to ensure that they have a healthy content of STEM in there. Well, I know that the Department of Education has worked hard on, on that, that rigor um, part, along with the regional CTP coordinators, to make sure that there are those strong connections. All of their programs are studied to the math and science and ELA standards. So there's been, it, it's not, it's not, our father's, you know, CTE programs anymore. I mean, there's there's a real intentionality there, um, both at a local level and a national level, um, around ensuring that rigor and ensuring that connectivity. And of course, we can always do more. Um, particularly, I think the opportunity around the next generation science standards and you know, what happens in CTE. I mean, it is is really super closely aligned, and and the opportunity I think is really to help science teachers understand the, the, the roles and the approaches that, that exist in the CTE world to uh, elevate their pedagogical approach I think, and, and partnerships with the industry. I think that there's a lot to be learned from the CTE world. I think it's, I mean, it's a, it's a two-way street. I'm not going to say it's one-dimensional, um, but I think that there's a huge opportunity there. And we do have some uh, sign up for a public comment. A public later. comment? We've got some. One public visit? Terry? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. You'll yield to the cloud. <laughs> well, this is an excellent meeting today. I think just learning about the progress we're making and these investments, the learnings we've had. Obviously, we didn't get the final reports completed. We've got to look at funding for the next cycle. This is what we had hoped to happen, at least at this stage in the, in the evolution of our council, which is to have some grants out there, to have functioning hubs. So we should feel really good about where we are. That doesn't mean we're done. I mean, we're just starting to kind of get into some of the big challenges ahead, but we've made good progress. We've got data, we've got information. We're to account for that. I really appreciate the Department of Education and all the work that's been done on that side to support this. Not that support we would do where we are. So to all the people at the Department of Education, thank you. John, you made great progress in pushing the envelope and thinking broadly and it should be like lots. Thank you all for thank you. We're very proud of the success we had. Albeit it's small, but that's where you start. You got to get a foothold on the beach to, 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 to kind of take on the take on the war. So next meeting, next meeting we're going to have to schedule because the the next meeting is not until September. So yeah. we'll have to do an inter uh, an Even inter meeting. By, can, are we allowed to do a phone? Yeah, absolutely. We can do a phone meeting. Uh, so, yeah, we've got to yeah, everybody. Meeting. I guess. Yeah, we meeting. can do a virtual virtual meeting on the phone. Absolutely. Yeah. As soon as we know the. I would, I would argue we would probably need, one. as soon as we have an initial budget read, we yeah. should at least have a, even if it's a 30-minute, all on the same page kind of budgetary conversation, and then a larger scheduled meeting as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And, yep, absolutely. And so, so that would be important. I do want to say in reflection, too, on this, I've, I've seen hundreds of different grant models nationally, Washington State, here, and I just have to tell you that I am thrilled by the, the level of impact that these grants have shown and how they are really uh, very complementary to each other and are really truly building that capacity in the system. They're not just these one-offs. They're really building that essential capacity. And so we'll see you know, that, and I'm confident that that change will accelerate over time, that these are really on target and on spot um, with the right degree of, uh, of support from, uh, from agencies and on the ground. Uh, really passionate leads out there uh, see this um, 
you know, at the big picture. So it's been really exciting. And I think you've got it right in terms of spending money on teacher development, which is you know, ultimately you need to get them excited and engaged. So they'll development, meaning they're pay volumes. They want to take, they don't have the time necessarily to need the space to create that learning yep. opportunity. All right, Thank anything you. else for the good of the order? Thank yeah, you all. Well, Very good meeting. Thanks to all of you who presented fantastic work and honestly. Yeah, well, thank you. Have a great Thanks, everyone. Thanks. 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 I'm, 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 I've got to run right now. I've got a bunch of Ramona's colleagues right